Howdy, welcome back to Dion Talk. This is gonna be another one of my nice short live streams. This last weekend, I was a keynote presenter at the Northwest Action Summit, which was an event put on for real estate investors. And there were some amazing speakers. I got to meet some people in person that I've interacted with online before. Um, that ADU guy, Jeff Stevens from Racking Up Rentals. I mean, there was like a list of people that I was really happy to connect with. My keynote speech was on the six actionable steps to get started in real estate. And for a new investor, these are six steps that you can start with. So before you have a rental, before you understand how you're going to invest, these will be steps that you can start taking now. If you've been investing for 10 or more years, these are gonna be steps that can apply to you too. Hopefully my sound is on. <laughs> Always my favorite to talk for a while and then find out that it's not. In 2022, we're seeing a massive shift in the market for the last two years, and, and we all tend to have really short memories. It's been a seller's market. So our short memories tell us this is the only market we're ever going to see. We're going to, you know, the fear of missing out <clears throat> belonged to the buyer. You had to make over asking offers. You had to have, act really quick. You had to make your offer in, in minutes, not hours or days. You had to waive contingencies. You Some people were offering to name their kids after their um, the sellers of the houses, something to get onto the radar of the people so that they, they can make their purchase um, offer stand out. That's a seller's market. At the few years before that, this is how short our memories are, 2015 to 2018, it was kind of normal to make an asking price offer or a little bit less, or the sellers would pay closing costs. You could negotiate closing costs in to, to, for the sellers to pay for it. In the last two years, that hasn't been a thing. Interest rates spiked, and now we're seeing that fear of missing out shift from buyers to sellers. People who are thinking, as prices go up, it might make sense for me to sell my property. This is a ridiculous amount of money. I never thought I would get it, so I should just sell it. And so now they've made the mental decision to offload a property, and then interest rates went up. Buyer demand goes away. Buying power goes away. There's still demand, but some people can no longer qualify because the interest rates and the price make it to where they don't have the income to qualify for it. So now, as an investor, what we should start doing is watching for properties that get on the MLS and then sit two, three, four weeks instead of two or three hours. And you might start to see at asking or under asking price offers look attractive. You might start to see sellers play closing, pay closing costs. So we're seeing that market shift. So the six steps that I'm going to talk about, about how to get started in real estate work, whether you're in a buyer's market, a seller's market, a balanced market, um, and markets shift quickly. So if you're a brand new investor, my keynote had to go on for an hour. My goal is that this portion of this live stream lasts 10 to 20 minutes. So I'm going to do the Cliff Notes version of the six steps. The keynote, I had to present kind of my story, why you might want to listen to me. So this is the 30-second version of that. 10 years ago, maybe a little more, 10 or 11 years ago, I was a single parent with three kids. Uh, I had been laid off from a police department and was teaching at a truck driving school making $17 an hour. And I found out about a lot of bad debt in my name that I didn't know existed until I got divorced. So I was in a really bad position. With my strategies for investing in buy and hold real estate, flash forward to 10 years and forward now from that position I started in, I now have 16 rental units that I self-manage. The cash flow, which is profit after principal, interest, taxes, insurance, setting aside for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy. Literally, the money that I get to take and spend or invest is over 100 to six figures. Um, work is completely optional. It took about eight years. I've used a combination of house hacking. I've house hacked twice. And the rest of it has been saving down payments and buying properties from the MLS with traditional lending. So no secret sauce, no seller financing, no... Um, Burr method, no flipping, no wholesaling, just slow and steady to reach financial freedom in 10 years or less. I think the average person can do it, even if you're not starting from the best position. So that was my Cliff Notes version of why I might be presenting. The six actionable steps to get started in real estate. Works worked in 2010, 
worked in 2008, worked in 2015, works today. These are steps that you can take if you have no rentals. These are, the, these are the same steps I'm taking with 16 units. The first step for everybody, no matter what your position is, is learning how to live on less than you make and learning how to save. And a lot of people, when we focus on saving, talk about reducing or eliminating your costs. So we have the latte factor where you cut out things like subscriptions or going for coffee. Uh, you have house hacking where I talk about reducing or eliminating, which for most of us is our largest expense, which is housing. But that's the mistake. You can only save 100% of what you make. It's a limited thing. And that's somehow if you're living in your mom's basement and they cover all the food and healthcare and transportation and you don't have any expenses, you can save 100% of what you make, of what you make. Our goal should be to be able to save 100% of what you make because if you can't save 100% of what you're earning from your job, you're still trapped in the rat race and you are not financially free. To, be cut, to reach financial freedom means you don't need your job, so you should be able to save 100% of it. That should be your savings rate goal. So we should focus on saving by eliminating costs. But the biggest thing that contributes to our ability to save is increasing the top line, the money that you have coming in. For some of us, that's working overtime at the job we have. For some of us, it's developing a skill. It could be getting a college degree. It could be getting an, an HVAC technician certificate. It could be getting a welding uh, certificate or license. It could be getting a CDL. It could be working in a field that has an apprenticeship program like electrician or plumbing to where at four years you can make journeyman level wages. What are you doing to increase that top line? For other people, Overtime might not be an option. Single parent, three kids. I worked as much as I could, but I still needed home time. It could be developing a side hustle. I have a couple. I have a video on my side hustles. I provide expert testimony for cases, which you can charge for. Uh, I actually played World of Warcraft and sold things online. So you can actually sell things. Uh, this is probably the easiest time in history to start a side hustle. You can start a small YouTube channel. On any topic, there is a subset of people who will watch. And YouTube doesn't pay a lot. But affiliate marketing pays better. Uh, on my channel, I've got some videos where I talk about here's the lock that I use to in my rentals, which is the actual lock I use. I give the reasoning that I use it. I, I talk about how it improves tenant retention, it, how it makes it to where I've never had to deal with a lockout. Like there's an actual reason why I'm backing up this lock. But how affiliate marketing works for something like Amazon is if you clicked on that lock and you went to Amazon just to look at it. Amazon puts a cookie on your computer for 24 hours. So anything that you purchased in the next 24 hours, I got a tiny little percentage of it. Didn't cost you anything extra, but I got paid for driving the traffic to Amazon. So those are side hustles that you can do to increase that top line. Reducing your bottom line matters. So now you're increasing this so that you can save and invest the difference between what you make and what you're spending. Because saving won't make you wealthy. You have to invest it. So that's the first of the six steps. Learn how to save. Doesn't matter where you're at in your investing journey. If you are living beyond your means, your assets aren't, if they're not covering all of your expenses, you are not going to be financially free for long if you are now. <clears throat> the second thing that you can be working on now, so this is the second step, which you can do at the same time as the first step, is to work on your credit score. And I understand if you're a Dave Ramsey fan, it says having a credit score is a trap because it makes you more likely to use credit cards and use, use consumer debt. And th think of things like buy now, pay later can be attractive. If you have a good enough credit score, they'll let you do that. And, and those are all mistakes. We don't want consumer debt. But to get the best interest rates for the home you're going to purchase or rentals that you're going to acquire, if you don't go the Dave Ramsey route and you go the way that I do where you use leverage or mortgages and don't over leverage yourself, the goal should be to have a 740 or higher credit score. You can start getting mortgages and loans in the 600s, but at 740 or higher, you get the best rates and terms and the most likely, you're the most likely to qualify for what you need to borrow. And there are several different ways to invest in real estate with, with lenders. There are um, uh, qualified mortgages where you are the borrower. They're gonna check your credit score, your income, your debt to income ratio, your salary, your work history, blood type, all the kind of things that they need to know if they can lend you money safely or not. There is asset-based lending, non-QM loans, DSCR loans, where they're going to look at the asset itself to see if it can produce the income. But even in those situations, your credit score is a factor. They're not going to look at your income, your debt-to-income ratio, your work history. You aren't a factor, but your credit score still matters. So you want to, no matter what your position on debt is today, you don't know what it's going to be in two or four years. So I would be working on the credit score because a better credit score doesn't hurt you. Those are the first two steps. 
The third step when it comes to investing in real estate is to find out what your options are. I would talk to a lender based on my debt to income ratio, my credit score, my work history. What can I borrow? What are my options? If your credit score is in the 500s and you just changed jobs last, last month, you got out of the military working in culinary. So you were a chef and then you get out and now you're a truck driver. That's a big career change, right? So all of that looks bad. But if you have a good credit score, that lender might tell you you're a good candidate for a DSCR loan or asset-based lending or non-QM or something where your information is, is, is looked at differently. Until you know what your options are, you won't know how to limit your search criteria. And if you've noticed, so far, I'm on step three, save, credit, lender. We haven't talked to a real estate agent yet. And most people think that's step one. They think, I want to talk to an agent, find out what's going on. I know a friend who's an agent. I have a brother or a cousin or somebody who's an agent. And the first bit of hard news to take is any real estate agent you know or work with and any lender you know or work with is not your mentor. An agent's job is to close deals. A, a lender's job is to sell loan products. They are not your, even if they're an investor, they're not the best option as a mentor. Because right now, at these beginning stages, if you try to find a mentor, you're going to be all over the board and don't know what you even need to learn. So it's really hard as a mentor to help somebody until they've got the, fake, the focus and the baseline of what they want to invest in. So the first three steps, anybody can do at any stage. The fourth step, still before we talk to an agent, is to figure out your strategy. How are you going to invest? And I wanna take a really quick second to explain the difference between strategies and tactics. This is something that's very important to understand because when you start looking up something like the Burr method, you're probably gonna watch a lot of videos on the Burr method and how the Burr method works. And the overarching buy, rehab a place, rent it out, refinance it, repeat. We, we get that, right? That's a strategy. Once you understand the strategy, watching a whole bunch of Burr method videos isn't going to help you. But how do you buy your properties? How do you run the numbers? How do you figure out your after repair value? All of those things that come into to play as you make your money when you buy. So you're going to watch a bunch of those videos because those are tactics. The rehab. How long does a rehab take? How much should it cost? What kind of things should I rehab that will actually add value to the property and not just spend money without an actual return? Those are tactics, things that you want to learn inside the strategy. So I'm not saying go the Burr method. I'm saying that is one strategy. And I'll probably butcher this during a live. Um, that's why I like to edit my videos. It's a quote from the, the book, The Art of War from Sun Tzu. <clears throat> strategy without tactics is the slowest path to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. So if you know how to find a property or you know how to screen a tenant and you really learn that tactic, but you don't have a strategy, you're just going to be all over the place and not actually have success. And if you figure out you want to do the Burr method, but you don't take the time to learn the tactics, you'll probably have a successful Burr at some point. But think of how long it's going to take and how many mistakes you're going to make along the way. Learn to save, work on credit, talk to a lender to find out your options, pick your strategy. If your strategy is to generate income, Wholesaling and flipping are usually the two that people go to, but those are jobs. Getting a real estate license adds a job. I am an investor, not an entrepreneur. So I wasn't looking to add a job. I wanted to add investments, cash flow that I didn't have to work for. So I've never wholesaled. I've never flipped. Uh, I'm not. There's a long list of reasons why I'm not a real estate agent. Those are strategies that work for some people if your goal is to create a job for yourself. They're episodical. You stop working, the money stops coming in. There are methods like buy and hold, but do you buy and hold storage? Do you buy and hold multifamily, small multifamily, single family? There's buy and hold long-term rentals, short-term rentals. There's all of these strategies that you need to pick what fits three things for you. Your goal, are you working towards financial freedom um, to grow a machine that just keeps growing to create general generational wealth? Are you, uh, What is your goal, right? Figure that out first to make sure that your strategy matches that. I needed, my goal was to create a side hustle that generated income that didn't take a lot of extra time. So I don't do the Burr method, even though that is a form of buy and hold. 
I don't self-manage short-term rentals because I don't have the time or bandwidth to do that right now. I self-manage long-term rentals and I buy rent-ready or already occupied properties that don't need a rehab. Been investing over 10 years, still haven't done a full rehab. So and closest I've come is paint and flooring. And, and while I have painted once or twice, flooring is, I call a guy. So I'm not even doing that kind of work. So what strategy fits your goals? What strategy fits your resources? How much time do you have to dedicate? How much money do you have to invest? Do you need partners? Do you need to find um, creative ways to generate uh, capital? And sorry, I have my notes here from my speech, which in a one hour speech, long speech looks like this. That's the total amount of notes you take when you do a one hour speech. I want to make sure I'm not forgetting something here. And the third thing, so you want to, what matches your goals, what matches your resources, and what matches your skill set. My brother is a craftsman. He buys falling down, literally pieces falling off, mobile homes on acreage in the middle of nowhere. And then he has craftsman skills to go in and do great drywall work with rounded corners, vaulted ceilings. Like he makes it look like an amazing rental. And so he's been able to buy properties that are very inexpensive, do a rehab, and then he uses a home equity line of credit on his own property. So he's never done a refi. So he does like a half a burr. I am not a craftsman. I do not have those kind of skills. I don't have the time to develop them. I don't have the time to do the work. So that strategy wouldn't work for me. Three things, goal, resources, skills, make sure that it matches that. So save, credit score, lender, um, strategy, step five of step six, all the way here at five, almost to the end. That's when you finally talk to a real estate agent. And here's where a lot of people mess up. A lot of people reach out to an agent before you've talked to a lender. Believe me, any agent that ever watches this in future land, or if there's any here today, they are going to thank you for talking to a lender before you talk to them. Because you know what your, uh, your, um, your limits are, you know what to set your searches for, you know what your options are. A lot of times if, if an agent is, is, is intuitive and you reach out to them, the first thing they're going to say is, have you talked to a lender yet? Okay, here's a couple re recommendations I have for you to go to talk to. Because it's a waste of an agent's time to even set up an auto search for somebody who's gonna wanna look at properties, tour properties, make offers on properties, and then not qualify for it. So step five is to talk to that agent. And there's a huge mistake that people make. First of all, there's a long list of reasons why I'm not an agent, but there's also a path to success is your team. And your team doesn't mean there's an agent that you work with. I specifically work with at least three agents. So the first thing I'm gonna say, agents don't like to hear. The second thing they might like to hear. The first thing is if you're a home buyer and you're going to look at 10 or 15 houses and you're gonna take up an agent's time and you're, and you're gonna ask a million questions, it absolutely makes sense for that agent to sign what is called a, an exclusivity agreement where you are only going to work with that agent, at least for a period of time, six months or a year or whatever. Totally makes sense for that agent to protect their time. But as an investor, I have a copy and paste cookie cutter. This is what I want. You know, this is my footprint, the type of properties I look at, the pricing, or, or you know, these are my no's. I don't want HOAs. I don't want foreclosures. I don't want short sales. Like the list of things I want. I send that to the agent to set up an auto search. The 20 minutes or so, maybe 30 minutes it takes them to set up that auto search and get it dialed in is the only interaction that agent is going to have with me, period, until I want to make an offer on a property that they send me. And I take this from Matt, the lumberjack landlord. Dance with the one who brung you. Somebody sends you a deal, you make sure they get the commission. So that's the first part that agents sometimes don't like to hear, is that I will not only exclusively work with one agent. On a deal, sure, I'll sign if they're making the offer, I will work with them until it's closed. But while I'm searching, searching for properties is nuanced. Like I said, the exact same cookie cutter email. These are the things I want for the agents to search. In over 10 years, my agents have one time, one time, sent me the same property within 24 hours. Now, with properties that sit on the MLS two or three weeks, yeah, they do tend, tend to send them, and I just look at who sent it to me first. So if I was only using one agent, or if I was an agent and I had full access to the MLS, I would still have other agents with auto searches set up. The second thing when it comes to agents is, and please take a note, pen and paper ready? Never, 
negotiate down an agent's commission. You want to fail in this business? This is a finite resource of people. This is a people business. Your reputation will follow you for decades. Now, an agent, you see them getting, I had an agent who got $17,000 commission one time on one of my properties. Okay. So let's cut that in half for his brokerage. Let's cut that in half. And, and you know, let's take out the, the MLS access fees as brokerage fees on top of them getting half of the commission. Let's take out the taxes. The amount of work that went into that person finding that deal, setting it up, making the offer, the training it took to be able to make the offer with the right legal forms and in such a way that I'm confident to make the offer without having to double or triple check their work. I just know I can trust that agent is so worth that amount of money that that agent, because I'm happy they made their commission, brings me deals. So they have auto searches set up. And I got a call last week where they, they called, literally said, which is weird, text in the future. But they called and they said, hey, in those most recent auto searches, have you seen this one? And then pointed out one that was a great deal. And I've got an offer in on it because that person, that agent wants me to make the offers because they know that I want them to earn money. The more money my agents make exponentially, the more amount of money I'm going to make now and in the future. So that's the first five steps. The sixth step, step six, after you've learned how to save, worked on your credit score, uh, picked a, uh, talk to a lender, picked a strategy, talk to an agent, because now you know what you want to invest in, how you want to invest and where you want to invest. Step number six is to do the work. Every single day, look at deals, run the numbers, Figure out if your strategy works in that area. I initially wanted to invest in single family houses here in Pearson, Thurston counties in Washington state. They don't cash flow. I shifted my strategy based on what would work. If I wasn't doing the work, I wouldn't have been able to figure that out. Run the numbers on more deals, more deals. Find people who you know who are investors. Ask them if you can run the numbers on their rental. Show them what you come up with. See how close you come to what their actual cash flow looks like. Six. Super simple, super basic steps to get started in real estate. That's the entirety of the secret sauce of, of my strategy to reach financial freedom. Along the way, I developed the binder strategy where I get my tenants to request a rent increase. That doesn't make it easier to find properties on the MLS. Um, but I'm not wholesaling. I'm not skip tracing. I'm not sending out mailers. I'm not using creative financing. I'm looking forward to doing seller financing in the future. I haven't done any yet. So... 23 minutes. I was shooting for 10 to 20. This at some point in the future, but not today, will be taken out and made as its own video on the six steps to get started in real estate. Um, and now for the rest of tonight, uh, as long as the questions keep coming in, I have uh, no timeline on how long this should last or could last. Um, I appreciate each question that comes in because I guarantee there's somebody who's new to the channel who doesn't know how I screen tenants, how I collect rents, how I get tenants to request a rent increase, um, how I run the numbers, like some of the basic things. And I do see some questions come up sometimes where I understand some really basic concepts are misunderstood. Like I need, I haven't figured out or scripted or thought of how I would do it yet, but I want to make a video on, the, the question comes up often on, I talk about having a positive net worth. And if you want to find out what that is this Thursday, <laughs> I have a portfolio deep delve coming out with Matt, the lumberjack landlord and Michael Zuber from one rental at a time where I literally feel completely naked, but I just share, here's the cash flow, Here's the debt structure. Here's the savings. Here's the everything. And then they tell me advice on what I should do. So if you really want to see those details, that's coming out Thursday. So if you're new to my channel, ask those questions. Somebody else is new too. And they're wondering, and I do have, sometimes I'll say, I have a video. The name of the video is this. This is what you search for. And then I'll answer the question now because you took the time to be here today. I will take the time to answer today. But every time you ask a question, it's going to help someone else too. And sometimes the right question tells me uh, this is a video I need to make. Um, and then one really quick thing before we get into the, the how do's and the questions. Today's video is sponsored to you by Alien Vodka and that vodka is going to tell us how long we can play tonight. Uh, and it's not actually a sponsor, but it is going to tell me how long I can go. Um, howdy. Bill and Tom and Dividend Dave, howdy. Chester, howdy. CJ, howdy. Don, howdy. Sundaya, howdy. Uh, 
Chester, audio, thank you. Sounds good. Angel, howdy. I heard, David and Dave, I heard a buyer paid for the seller's trip to Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, technically, everybody who's taken a trip to Hawaii that was a seller, the buyer paid for it. I like that. Larry, howdy. Uh, glad your voice is back again. So, yeah, I left Florida, and I think I, so I'm not allergic to shellfish. I, I, I ate so much shellfish in Florida, like there were um, lobster Bloody Marys. And then as I was leaving Florida, I ate one last thing um, somewhere across the country. I drove to Portland for that keynote speech this weekend. And I stopped somewhere and poorly chose to eat at a red lobster, which was probably frozen and whatever was wrong with it. I had an allergic reaction, um, body aches everywhere. My throat was like somebody was stabbing and I lost my voice. So I'm driving across the country and I have lost my voice. I don't know how long it's going to last to go do a a presentation in front of a couple hundred people. It was a fun trip. Um, Laura, howdy. Chris Webb, howdy. Central Virginia, nice. Doug, howdy. I'm trucking across I-20 in Louisiana tonight. Nice. Hopefully I won't put you to sleep. I might randomly scream, look out once in a while. We'll see. Clinton, howdy. Got the notification, but still a minute late. No worries. Um, Nick, howdy from Texas. I think I drove around Texas this time. There was hurricane warnings um, or tornado or whatever you guys get there. So I drove up and across. Dan, howdy. How's the multifamily deal going? Any progress? No progress on the, the one that's for sale. I did resubmit another offer. So re really quick backstory. Um, Property hit the MLS, which was my goal. My current goal is to put my money where my mouth is. And I've often said, I wish my properties cost more as long as the return scaled with the increase in cost. So I want to buy a fourplex that costs at least a million dollars. So I've saved the down payment to do an investment purchase on a fourplex. One hit the MLS, 1.3 million. Numbers didn't make sense. They made sense last year when interest rates were less, but interest rates have gone up. So 1.3 didn't make any sense. Watched it for a couple of days, made an offer of 1.1. They came back and they said, well, we magically have a bunch of offers and we need your best and final. So I resubmitted 1.1. Uh, it hasn't sold. It didn't sell. But recently I was watching Michael Zuber, who has a guest come on, and I forget the guy's name because I got the great memory, um, of a 50-40-10 loan option, which gives you a blended interest rate that's much lower. So the 50% is 50% LTV. So it gets you the best rate from a lender. So that's coming from the lender. Then the seller carries a note for 40% at 1% interest. So the 1% and whatever your interest rate is for the 50% gives you that blended rate below 4%. And then as the buyer, I come to the table with 10% down. Resubmitted that offer. They're either thinking it over or they've dismissed it and haven't answered yet. So that's where that is. But I took the last month and a half, seven weeks or so, and I did scuba diving in Florida until I was bored and now I'm home. Um, now I'm going to dig in deeper and look for that next property. And so we'll see what I'm finding. I think we are gonna to start to see properties sit on the MLS longer as rates have gone up and sellers aren't getting that wish price that they listed for. So what we need to do is find somebody who's in that position who is also a motivated seller. And a couple of days later, make that offer that makes sense at our numbers. Uh, my chat moved, which means people are putting questions, which I really appreciate because this live stream can go on an hour and we'd be done. Or well, there can be questions and it can go on three or four hours. I've had them last four hours. Um, so the, the length of the live stream is up to the viewer. Buddy, howdy. Could you send us a template of what you send your agents? I have sent it several times to people. Um, I'm going to put it in the description to this video because normally what I say is I'm going to give you, you know, put my email, then you reach out. And for some reason, sometimes even the people who ask for the information are like afraid to reach out with an email, like I'm going to run a scam or something. So I'll put it in the description of this video after we close tonight. I'll just copy and paste right there. If there's enough room, I'll pin it in the comment. Um, but it'll be available after we shut down this live stream on this video. I will also later be putting my email in and anybody who wants it in an email, just email me and I will send it to you. Um, yeah. Julius, howdy from Indy. Nice. Janelle, howdy. 
For a seller financing deal that's on the MLS, other than factoring in agents' commissions, what else should I look for in the calculations? So a lot of people fall for the trap of setting interest rates based on what's going on with banks' interest rates. Uh, sellers don't care about the interest rate. You might make an offer of at 1% or 4%, the higher the interest rate, the lower the offer, right? Uh, to, to finding out what matters to the seller. I like to use the Lumberjacks um, strategy of reaching out to the seller and finding out what matters to them. So it could be a, uh, you need a place to live for two or three months until you find your place that you're going to buy or, or, or something that matters to them that's not, that they're not able to put on the MLS. So that's not easily discernible. Like you have to actually ask to find out what matters. Um, covering, making sure that your down payment covers enough to where they, the agent's fees are covered so that they're not writing a check. Find out if they do have any kind of mortgage remaining. Do, will your down payment be enough to cover that mortgage or do you need to take out a loan from a bank to cover that mortgage, pay the agent's fees and give them their down payment? Because the seller's goal with seller financing is there's a couple main goals, but you never know which one matters the most. Is it to avoid capital gains? Is it because getting a lump sum of money would be nice, but with a burn rate, you'd just be out of it in a few years? Or do they want steady payments every month for the next 30 years where they're earning a little bit of interest, but they're just getting that payment without having to worry about the three T's, tenants, termites, and toilets. So I would make sure it covers those things. Julius, do lenders look at your three credit scores or your FICO 8 score? Um, there, I, I, it does not the three that we see. They're not going to look at the ones that we see. It's a different one. Um, I believe I heard on one rental at a time recently that you can ask, you can ask a lender to pull a soft credit score and share it with you to see what they're going to see. Soft credit doesn't impact your credit score. Um, I don't have it committed to memory, which one that they use though. So I don't have the right answer. I'd have to Google it. I just know it's not the ones that we see. Um, Angel. Yes, sir. Adam. Howdy. Are you going to refinance your properties or just let your yourself uh, pay them off? I have never taken cash out or done a home equity line of credit. Um, so here's a behind the scenes thing that I'll probably talk about next week's live stream. Hopefully a bunch of people watch the, deep, the portfolio deep delve. I have 16 rental units. The cash flow each month, profit after principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and setting aside for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy is like this much over $14,000. That's an average of seven to $800 per unit, right? It happens because I don't refinance and take money out. I don't home equity line of credit. I could have two or three times the number of units if I recycle capital the way Michael Zuber does or Matthew Lumberjack Landlord does. You know, they've got 187, 217 or 117 units, whatever, respectively, their unit count is. Their goal is, is a bigger machine that builds generational wealth. Mine was financial freedom. I have 16 units with a little over $14,000 a month in cash flow. I don't know that I even want 16 units. I might sell off the single family house, take the money and pay off two of the mortgages on duplex. I would increase my cash flow to about probably 1500 a month, 15000 a month but have a whole less property to deal with. Um, so I don't plan on paying debt off with my own money ever early or funneling cash flow to pay off debt. I've done that once. I paid off one property when you were only allowed to have four in your name. I did it because it made sense. And interest rates then were 6% or so. So it made sense to pay it off. But with debt under 5%, all my loans are below 4% except for one. It doesn't make any sense to pay those off. The tenants will pay them off over time. I don't want to refinance. I don't want to cash out refi. I don't want a home equity line of credit. I don't want to do anything because it's funny to watch the lumberjack landlord's eyes twitch when he thinks of, he calls it dead equity, just money sitting on my properties. But I think it only took eight years to make work completely optional. And I could literally, so try to, so I'm try, trying, to I'm trying to think of a way to say this where it doesn't sound like bragging. I want people to understand the first five years suck. Building, getting to the point of the income snowball sucks. Increasing your income, which is stressful and time consuming and you have to be creative. Reducing your spending and, and driving 15 or 20 year old cars and not taking trips. 
and all and and create and not you know avoiding life creep that, that all sucks but i just took a trip to florida where my goal i did a five i, I allocated five thousand dollars a month for a vrbo and five thousand dollars a month for scuba food a little bit of alcohol um right so I, my goal was to spend five thousand dollars so a total of 10 per month I took my laptop, so I did some work. So I'm still going to get paid from work, right? But let's take that out. Just my rental portfolio. Not growing, not having 100 units, not recycling capital, not doing cash out refinances, not doing homemaker dealing and credits, just saving a down payment, buying a rental, made it possible to where I went down there. It probably didn't even hit my goal, but let's say I hit my goal of spending $10,000 a month. The cash flow was over 14. So that meant every month, that I, I stayed in Florida at a VRBO that I don't have to maintain. I just spend the five grand every month to be there. And I tried to spend five grand. Like I went scuba diving. Um, there's some talk of uh, shooting rifles from a helicopter or shooting things that blow up at a, at a range. Like I was trying to find ways to spend money. I came home every month that I spent there, I would come home to $4,000 more in my account than when I left because I haven't done a refi. Told the bartender to hold the hair. Um, where was I? That's a great question, Adam, thank you. Kevin, howdy. Thank you. Thank you for hanging out, I appreciate it. CJ Underwood, CJ, howdy. Thank you for the beginning. I am still working on my system for tenant turnover. How far in advance do you list and start showing the unit? Once vacant, or do you try to get a tenant in there with absolutely zero vacancy? So I've never had vacancy. Um, an, an example, I have two tenants moving next month. One is buying a house, one's moving out of area. So. Sucks to see him go. I have to change my verbiage because my memory sucks. It's been really easy to say. 10 years of being a landlord, I've had two tenant turnovers. So now I'm going to have four. The one who's buying, I believe, is out of the house now. And I'm, I should go down and check and see if it's ready to start working on to get ready for June 1st. So I have not listed it. It'll be available June, June 1st. Some people say list it a month in advance to get people who are coming at the end of their lease. Demand is too high in my area. The other one, I've already had, I have a list. It's almost 10, it's like eight people now who have applications in just like, you know, through email. I haven't listed it yet. Just word of mouth, people in the area asking. So depending on the demand in your area, um, Lumberjack Landlord listed three places last weekend, had over 200 and is still getting applications in for just those three places. So demand for rentals is extremely high. If you were in a place where demand was low, I would list it several months in advance, get people to look at it, plan for the future, plan the time of year I was going to switch. So it was most likely to be in the summer when people are more likely to change. But in our current market, it depends on your local market. In my current market, the, the problem is going to be picking the tenant, not finding the tenant. Um, so I, I, I will list with less than a week, probably, of putting a tenant in place. Angel, you should try Casa Mijos tequila with ice, salt, and lime. I am a tequila fan. I like kamikazes. Uh, I will definitely have to try that. Doug, howdy. Looking forward to Thursday for sure. I appreciate your willingness to be transparent with your finances, Matt and Michael, as well. So it's it's really weird when you share the finances. There's There's two things. One, you set yourself up to be scammed, targeted, whatever. Um, but the second thing is it's not relatable. Like if somebody 10 years ago told me you're going to make so much money, you can go and scuba and just do everything you want for a month. And when you come home, you're going to have more money than when you left. Like I barely understood that when I went and spent a month in, um, Colombia and Thailand where the, the dollar is super strong. So the cost of everything is really, um, significantly less that my brain can understand. I came home with more money than what I left with, but this was an expensive area doing expensive stuff. Um, so for very good reasons, 
Matt and Mike don't share cash flow. They don't share net worth. They don't share those kind of things because our goal is to get that, that new investor to four rentals. Like life changes at four rentals. So if we can get you there and Michael Zuber says it all the time, the reason he picked four is because you can understand it. If he said, if you get to 187 units, like Mike has, this is what your life could be like. I don't even want 187 units. So it's not relatable. Right. But when he talks about four, when I read the book, which is way over there, um, one rental at a time, I, I, you know, I had been investing for years. I didn't find it until 2018. I was like, this is exactly what I did. So here's the humble brag. My portfolio is still small enough to where I can share numbers and it's still kind of relatable. 16 units, 14,000 a month in cash flow. Like those are numbers we can we can still process. Um but it does feel weird to sh to share it. So I actually I did the video on Mike's channel. And I thought I'll share it there. I'm like I'm like step removed. Um and then once it was done and we put it up, I, I realized that's absolutely not fair to the people who watch my channel, who have come to my live streams. So I was like, if I want to share this kind of stuff, this is where it needs to go. So let's come up here on Thursday. Uh, Angel, we'll take you straight to Tulum. <laughs> my chat moved, sorry. Alizel, Alizette, howdy. From Portland, big fan, learning from a ton from you. I was just in Portland. That was where the um, Northwest Action Summit was. Um, I was their keynote speaker, which really was the first 23 minutes of this video. It took an hour there because I had to do more of my story in it. Um, but this was the Cliff Notes version. John, Texas, howdy. Julie, howdy. Bolo, howdy. Angel took back a message to make me lose sleep and wonder forever what was there. Do you prefer top or bottom freezers for B-type rentals? Mine are, what do I buy? So I don't do B-type rentals, I do C-type rentals. And all of my refrigerators just have a, ref a freezer I don't even know if they have two doors. They don't have two doors. The top, you open it, top is freezer bottom. I buy from like $700 from Lowe's or Home Depot, depending on what they currently have in stock. So they're not really fancy. If I had a B, I would probably do a bottom freezer. There's got to be a better, better machine for class B. But there's a couple of reasons why I don't like class B. Um, one of them is you need higher end appliances. Bobby, howdy. I was on a live with Matt, the lumberjack, the other day and asked him where to get a good rental lease for Washington State. You chatted to get a hold of you and you might share. How do I get a hold of you? Um, my email. There. And when it comes to leases, I think I said it in the chat. I, I was there for that live stream as well. Um, I wouldn't use a lease from Washington in another state. And even the one here in Washington, I would I would go through and edit it specifically for your property. Um, the layout of, you know, yard maintenance requirements, um, anything else that's specific to your property. Something I learned from my brother was to contact the attorney that you would use during an eviction. <clears throat> I keep one on retainer, but I asked them, and, and I, I didn't do this for a while. I just did it recently. I was like, what verbiage, what, what phrasing would you like in the lease that will make your job easier if we have to do an eviction? So they sent me a little thing. I put up my lease. Um, yeah. A good way to get a lease for your area that was made by an attorney specifically for your state is to become a Bigger Pockets Pro member for at least a month or two. They have a lease for every state. Download it. Once you download it, it's yours. So you don't need to maintain the membership. Although you might, because there's a lot of other things you can use on Bigger Pockets uh, website, but that's one way to get a lease specifically to your state. The one I have that I use, there used to be a website called Landlord Tenant Resources here in Washington State, and on it they had a, an example of a lease. I checked that; it's gone. So I don't know what the deal was, but it went away. Dividend Dave, 
Could you provide any insight into how one could find a strategy that works in the market they're interested in? Could they talk to an investor in that area? So that's exactly how I would do it. I'd go to a local REI meetup, but I'd also run the numbers. Look, look at how do single families cash flow looking at price, rate, rents, like the three main factors that are going to help you determine that. Um, but it takes 60 to 90 days to learn what that average is because you have to look at rentals like a snapshot right down on a spreadsheet where they're at, how much they rented for, the date you looked at them, look a week, two weeks, three weeks later, the ones that are still listed are probably listed too high. So you can figure out your rents that way. But you can also run the numbers and figure out do you know, my, I have friends who invest in Ohio where sing, and Gary, Indiana, where single family houses um, run just fine. Millennial Mike invests specifically in Gary, Indiana, because he can cash flow single family houses. Um, he found that by reaching out, you know, by taking like a mentor with Mark Matsky from Matsky Finance, where they, you know, he kind of helped him develop his system. So reaching out to an investor, because no matter where you live, somebody is investing successfully there. And a lot of people say, well, I can't invest here because everything costs too much, too high cost to live in. The more expensive the area you live in, the more impactful house hacking is. A lower down payment means a lot more when a house costs a million dollars than when it costs $18,000. Uh, better interest rate, same thing. Um, reducing or eliminating a four or $5,000 a month housing cost is a lot more impactful than getting rid of $1,000 a month housing cost. Um, so house hacking becomes the strategy for more expensive areas. Kind of like Millennial Mike, it's, it's a form of genius. Lives in Seattle, stupidest thing, so not genius. Um, crazy genius is a really fine line, right? But again, his job keeps him in Seattle. So he house hacks. He's in a high cost of living area. He house hacks a duplex, basically lives for free. He invests out of state where it makes sense, where the cash flow is better on single family houses in another state. I think he has maybe maybe a duplex other. I don't think so. I think he just has the one. So we were talking, we did a video a while back on what his what he should do. Investing at a distance, great. But capitalizing on that house hacking locally to where every year or two, he can add another duplex where in Gary, he might cash flow where the yield is good, but the cash flow per property is 250 to $350. Where a house hack here, once he moves out, that one property will cash flow $2,400. That's a lot of houses in Gary, Indiana with just one property here. So Figuring out the strategy that works for you based on your area, how investors are investing there, and whether it makes sense to house hack, invest at a distance, because what fits your strategy, what fits your resources, and what fits your skill set. Local REI meetups is a good one. Uh, Ryan, if you ever put up a question and I miss it, Please re-put it up because sometimes the chat moves and I miss it. Ryan, howdy. I think it is Stephen Dow from Velocity Mortgage. I think it was too, yep. Tony, howdy. I'd like to express my gratitude. You are authentic and as a person as you are on YouTube. Met you at Portland Conference, so very honored. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate you driving over. Um, I think I have a picture of us and the book that you got. Actually, you didn't give me permission to share your face on. on I'm not going to do that to you. Um, no, it's really great to meet you, Tony. I think I think you're going to do great. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the book. Larry, what different things would you do if you landed a seller finance deal? Seek a specialist or a real estate attorney, offer seller pay through attorney fees. I would use my real estate agent. I am not trying to reduce or eliminate his ability to make money. And I want him motivated to be to, to bring me deals in the future. So while I do work with several agents, there's one who's consistently found me the deals and done amazing work. So if I did a seller financing deal, uh, I would have him make the offer. That, you know, here's here's my seller financing letter, which I've sent to several people, and you can email me, and I will send it to you. Emails in the chat. Um, and the, but it also said, you know, whether it's seller financing or conventional lending, here's my offer submitted from the agent. And my down payment will include enough money to cover the agent's fees so that the seller's not writing a check to lose an asset. Um, I would use a real estate attorney if I didn't have any kind of existing relationship with an agent that I trusted, uh, but I do. So I would use the agent. And that is a good question. 
but finding a real estate attorney is, and it's probably area specific too. I know that, you know, I invest in Washington where the seller picks the title company in most places or places I invest at anyways. And in Florida, all of the counties, except for one County, the seller picks the title company. And then in one County, I forget the name of it. It's where Naples is. Uh, the buyer picks the title company. Um, so to learn your area to figure out whether an agent or an attorney would make sense. Dividend Dave, that's scary. I'm glad you made it out of that lobster experience. Yeah, I was, I'm just glad my voice came back because, uh, I mean, there was like two months of advertising and putting out flyers and advertising in Facebook groups and stuff about this event coming up. And somebody like Tony literally drove 185 miles and sent me an email saying, I'm going to the event because you're going to be there. Imagine what, what kind of a douche I would have felt like if I couldn't talk and that had happened. Kevin, how do you refute anti-landlord people that say landlords do not provide housing, they instead take away housing and drive up pricing on houses that could be already occupied? <clears throat> Here's the quote. I have to clear my throat. So write this quote down. This is a Dionism, which I obviously got from a meme because it's the only place I get my information. Never argue with fools because at a distance, you cannot tell them apart. Why? Why would you care? Like um, when Business Insider did uh, an article, they did four articles on me. One of them was on the binder strategy on how to get a tenant to request a rent increase. That hit the anti-work Reddit group. And there are literally tens of thousands now, tens of thousands of comments calling for my execution. And in creative ways too. Some of them are pretty creative. Um, three Fs. If they're not feeding you, effing you, or financing you, what do you care about their opinion? You're not going to change it. Um, you can have some justifiable internal dialogue when somebody says, well, landlords don't provide housing. I'm like, okay, so how many houses did I take away when I bought duplexes, triplexes, or fourplexes? How many of those would have been single family houses that somebody owned? So that, you know, small multifamily, multifamily doesn't happen. How many people want to rent? You know, in 2020, the pandemic happened and a whole bunch of people all of a sudden had the ability to work from home. So that increased demand for buying houses outside of cities. A lot of people had to work in cities or Silicon Valley or wherever the work was you know, centrally located. Well, now they can work at a distance so they can live anywhere, right? But not everybody thought this is forever. They thought this is for a year or two until the pandemic is over and then I'm going to have to move back into the city. So buying a house would have sucked. They have to rent. They want to rent. So you can justify it, but I would only do it internally. I would not try to educate or change someone else's opinion on do landlords provide housing. I would be like what the the picture from Zombieland where he's laying on the table crying, wiping his face off with $100 bills. Um, let people think whatever they want. The biggest threat is when people do things that are stupid, like voting rent control, like they did in St. Paul. That 3% rent, rent control cap across the board, which actually impacted one of the rare times where it impacted new builds too. So construction pulled out, people stopped doing projects. So now we have less houses. The ability to profit, the reason we get tax benefits in real estate is because the government, luckily, not um, whether whatever side they're on, left or right, says landlords don't provide housing. The government knows you do. So we have a tax incentive program. I'm, I'm probably going to make a video if I can think of the script where with my W-2 job, I made six figures and the government took 37%. And with my real estate, I made six figures. The government said, I'll tell you what, you keep it all. And next year, if you make more profit than you have as a write-off, we'll even let you write off some of that from this year. You'll carry that forward. Like they want you to own rental properties. Because the government knows that's the solution to housing is incentivizing people to create more houses, even if it's to rent out. And then you can internally point out the discipline it takes to save 20 or 25 percent down to buy a, an investment property or the, the fortitude it takes to buy an investment property and house hack it for a year. So move in and then know in a year you're going to move out like the planning and strategy there makes it hard enough to become an investor that the people that are saying you don't provide housing are just freaking lazy can't save 3% down on a million dollar house. That's 30 grand, right? Did any math on that, right? Yeah. 30, if they can't save $30,000, they're not going to be able to maintain a million dollar house. 
Um, and even if it costs 500,000, so reduce them by 50%, they're not going to be able to do that. Um, there are a lot of people who rent because it's the best strategy for them. So good question. Don't answer them, but you can think it through yourself. Sean, howdy. Can you buy real estate with federal or state tax liens? Tax liens for the last couple of years don't show up on personal credit file, but not sure if they will come up when buying. So I know there's courthouse sales, which some of those can be initiated by um, overdue taxes. Uh, there are skip tracers who can find out information on what's going on with taxes for people. Um, I know you can. I know that uh, it's a strategy I haven't looked into, so I would give you an uneducated form of doing it if I tried to answer that question now. I just know it's possible. Um, so it's going to take some research to figure that out. Ryan, my market just had a bunch of stuff added today. We're seeing increases pretty much everywhere, and they're not going as fast. So I think Michael Zuber said this really well. You know, a lot of us say we have a supply issue. There's just not enough houses. Well, we did over 6 million transactions last year, so that's not true. We have enough supply. It's just the demand is so fast, it churns it, and it goes really quick. Well, now the demand is going away. So it's the same amount of supply is going to make a supply buildup, which means watch for those deals that sit long enough. Make the offers that make sense because you're not going to get all of them. You're not going to get 90% of them, but you're going to get the one that's a motivated seller at the right time because you don't need all the deals. You just need that one deal. Chyla, howdy. Are you seeing very many good deals out there or are we looking at an upcoming slowdown with better options? We definitely are seeing an upcoming slowdown. I'm seeing deals that make sense that aren't flying off the shelves like they were two, three months ago uh, where I can, I, you know, emotionally I go, someone bought that and is taking a loss. Like, why would they do that? But logically I can think through, there was somebody who was looking for a place to park cash where they don't want to lose value. So they're not looking for cash flow. There's somebody who's trying to redeploy a 1031 exchange where they're only mentally looking at the money it took to get the first property and not looking at the expense of the equity as an actual investment. So there, there are many reasons why somebody would pay what I would consider overpaying for a property. Logically, I can do that. Um, we're going to see more and more properties that sit on the MLS and to the point where it's time to do the work, know what average is, make the offers. You're not going to get all of them, but you're going to get the one who's motivated. Um, keep hunting. Levi, howdy. Should I say meowdy? <laughs> I did that one video with that one cat and it bit my face. I'm nice to animals. That cat did not go flying across the room. Um, currently in house hack. Nice. First time being landlords. Do you find house hack or normal tenants are more demanding than others? All else equal. Uh, it's so dependent on the tenant. I have one tenant who they were a young couple. They're no longer a couple. And when the guy moved out, but the first year I, I had to educate them on everything on what was an emergency, you know, fire, flood or blood. The conversation happened a couple of times. What needs to be fixed? What doesn't need, what's tenant's responsibility? Well, if you have a septic problem and this is what the clog is, it's a you problem and not a me problem. I fix it, but you're paying for it. Um, but I'm, I'm smart. They, they were young and they didn't have a lot of money and they didn't, weren't educated. So they didn't pay for it. That's been allocated to come out of the deposit and when they move. So that money is spent. Um, so you have options as a landlord. That is a tenant not someone I would, I would live next. It's a, it's a duplex. I could live on the other side. It's actually one of the sides that's coming up available here next month. Um, I live in a fourplex. The tenants on the other sides I've, I've interacted with two or three times. I've had the same number of tenant calls there as anywhere else though. I, I think I've seen the tenants in two years, maybe two or three times. I don't know why we just, they don't exist. <laughs> they pay the rent on time. Um, so I have no difference between house hacking, although I don't rent by the room. So I have roommates, right? I rent by the room for that. So those tenants are different. I do interact with them more. Um, but I travel so much. I just really kind of do that because I want someone there, right? Um, and I don't know if you know this or not, but I like money. And money comes from having roommates. And uh, so I still do that form of house ha hacking mostly because I travel. If I ever stop traveling so much, I'd probably stop doing that. Um, I haven't done the separate a house into different living quarters. I've done small multifamily. Um, so really no difference between house hacking and other tenants. Uh, yeah, I kind of look at them all the same. 
uh, ironically, and let me know if you want me to explain this. I see all of my tenants as much richer than I am. Um, Daniel, follow up from last month. Howdy. The new Tundra has a 32 gallon tank and as long as it's not the base trim, I would definitely see you rocking one in orange. Thanks for all you do. The Tundra was my favorite truck. I've had a Ford Raptor, I have an F-250 right now, uh, and a Corvette. Like I've cycled through some nice vehicles, but you know, not in the first five years. Well, before you have the income snowball, I had I had Jeeps where the, the 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 year and model started with a 19 up until 2016 to 18, somewhere in there. That was when I finally started getting newer vehicles. Um, yeah, but the Tundra is the most comfortable truck. It drove the best. Uh, six inch lift is good. Eight inch lift was not so great. It broke the brakes. So, uh, but the, the, the drawback was it had a tiny fuel tank. Uh, didn't like that. Um, Kelly, howdy. I'm looking to house hack as a single parent and looking for an affordable property in a good area to house hack is hard in this market. Um, how are you searching? A big mistake a lot of people make is they search on Redfin and Zillow and uh, you know secondary markets to find small multifamily, and that's not where they are. A lot of municipalities are set up where you have the city kind of spread out, and you'll have one or two little pockets where somebody purchased it in the in the 80s or, or the 90s, and they built 10 duplexes. So those are not good areas. They're usually all tenants, all renters. Um, they haven't appreciated much. So almost all of my properties are in residential areas where it goes house, 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 triplex, me, house, house, house. So that triplex is appreciating at the rate of all the houses around it because it's not in a, in a small multifamily area. It's in a good area because there's a lot more homeowners there. So there's more um, emphasis on the school districts. The only way I'm finding small multifamilies that make sense to house hack are from the MLS. Just traditional, go get your auto searches set up. Don't use Redfin. Don't use Zillow. That is dated material. The only time I've seen the deals I've purchased on Redfin or Zillow is two or three months after I've closed. They show up as pending. Um, so it's very dated information. Um, also, there's an asset type that you can add to your search that gets missed. Homeowners don't want this because they don't want tenants. And, in, and, and investors miss this because they don't know the verbiage. So we have single family, small multifamily, and multifamily. Between single family and small multifamily, there is house with an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit. Some states call it an auxiliary dwelling unit, but it's basically two houses on one property. But to search for it, you can't use the term ADU. We know that term, but you have to find out the colloquialism that's used in your market. Some agents will list it as a granny flat. Some will call it a mother-in-law house. Some will call it a DADU for detached auxiliary dwelling unit or accessory dwelling unit. So I, in your auto search, list all of them so that it, whatever it's listed at, the numbers will work just like a duplex. It's two houses on one property. You get single fund, true single family financing. So the best interest rate because small multifamily gets a little bump. And some, most lenders will want more down for a duplex, triplex, or fourplex unless you go FHA, then it's 3.5 across the board. But conventional for single family and some conventional for duplexes is 3% down if you've not owned a house for the last three years or 5% down if you already own a property. So you have a ton of options. I would change how you're looking. That would be my guess. But it is totally worth it, Kelly. House hacking is the one reason why I'm financially free. And I didn't do it a bunch of times. I've only house hacked twice in 10 years. I'm still house hacking, but I've only had to do it twice. So I'm the lazy investor. I don't move every year. Uh, like um, you know, Jeremy Kirkwood, who's got the eight kids and he's buying enough to give each kid their own property. I mean, he's killing it, but he's going to move a lot and do a lot of work. He's way more motivated and, and than I am. Um, Chidia, Chidia, howdy. Um, how do you pick a good lender? So I have a video on my channel called How to Get the Best Interest Rates. It's about a t eight to 10 minute live stream where I just did stream of consciousness. This is how I get the best interest rates, but it's also how I get a good lender. 
So I start with a large bank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, to figure out what my options are because I want to know from the most standardized criteria, what can I do? Because other lenders are usually more creative and flexible. A small credit union or a local small bank can do all kinds of things that a big bank won't. So knowing that means that you'd be locked into that, that lender only. If, you're, if you have general approval from a large bank to do certain things, all the other lenders will know that they can at least do that or maybe better. Once I have a property under contract, I will shop lenders. If you'll shop contractors for a $5,000 deck project, why wouldn't we shop lenders for a $300,000 commitment for 30 years, right? So take the bank's offer in writing, even just a printed out email to other lenders and show them and say, here's what they're offering. Can you beat it? Because I don't care about the relationship with the lender. I am not building for those first 10 commercial and first 10 residential loans in my name. These are just loans getting the best loan product from the most competitive lender. After you have 10 in your own name and you start having to go commercial and get creative with your lending, yes, you're then going to focus on one lender and you're going to make sure you develop the relationship like Matt has with his where they can do all kinds of creative things for you. I'm not there yet. I don't plan on getting there. I don't want to have more than 10 mortgages. I don't want to have more than 10 properties. Um, financial freedom right now is happening with seven properties, and six mortgages, with 16 rental units. Um, you show the big banks offer to the other lenders to see if anybody can beat it. They can beat it in a few ways. They can have a better interest rate. They can have better fees. They can have a lower cost to buy down the rate. They'll tell you the, they'll be the first one to point out a fee that the bank has that seems large. One, if they give you something that would beat it, you take it back to the bank, you give them a chance to keep your business. And for the first couple, Wells Fargo kept my business. After that, Fairway Mortgage was able to beat them with things they couldn't compete with. So now Fairway has my business. I'm still now currently working with Matt, the mortgage guy, um, looking at Convoy Home Mortgage for their DSCR loan. So depending on what loan product I'm looking for, it's the lenders I'm looking at. Um, some people would say, well, if you, you look at the bank, they might, they might check your credit. They might. So you're going to get a six point hit on your credit score that will go away in a couple of months. When you do that, you have 30 days to have other creditors check, sorry, check your credit without getting another impact to your credit score. But if a large bank has approved you, I have never had another lender run my credit to tell me that they can beat it and put in writing how they can beat it until I have said, okay, your rate and fees beat them. Let's go ahead and do this. Then they'll run the credit, um, but you're already on the second, you're in that 30 day window to do that. Uh, that was a great question. Thanks. Melinda, howdy. Kelly. I found a property in BC area and barely works. Enough income to cover cash flow. Hesitant to pull the trigger. $500,000 duplex, 13 to 15 each side. So is there an HOA? What do the property taxes look like in your area? How much work needs to be done? Because remember, cost to acquire is down payment, closing costs, immediate repairs, the money it takes to make it rent ready. There's a bunch of other factors there. And we're not just trying to cash flow. What will the yield be? How much money will you have to put down? And then how much will the cash flow get you as a yield? So you take your annual profit, how much money you're going to make every month times 12. You divide that by your cost to acquire. Annual profit divided by cost to acquire will get you a percentage. You learn your area for 60 to 90 days to find out what an average deal is. So if average is 3 or 4%, you want to make sure you're looking for 5 or 6%. If average is seven or eight percent, you want nine or ten percent. So you want to be looking for the deals that are better than average. So you know you're putting your money to its best work. Um, Five hundred thousand, thirteen to fifteen each side. Are the rents that now, or are the what is the area average rents, and how how are you finding that? Because I used to use Rentometer and call the housing authority, but those use historical data. Those don't work anymore. Um, rents went up too fast. So now I'll actually go today, currently, like I was trying to rent a unit with this same number of bedrooms on apartments.com, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, and see what the rents are currently. Um, so there's a lot of ways to run the numbers and don't get a deal just to get a deal. Make sure it's a good deal. And watch how long that sits on the MLS. Maybe it's at 500,000 because that's what they thought they can get before interest rates went up. Maybe it sits for a few weeks and now you can offer 420, 430. Ryan, I believe it is the mean or average score. Okay. Galen, howdy. <laughs> Peter, howdy. The DSCR loan isn't going because I didn't get the offer accepted yet. I think the place went pending and now I'm in second position for that one. 
Um, but it is nice to have a loan product. And I met a lender this weekend that does up to 12 units. So I'm expanding my search with DSCR loans, um, 30 year fixed rate debt. Uh, so I will let you know how that goes. Daniel, howdy. Angel, I have a great tenant. He's been with me for over a year under market rent by $75. Do you think we should upgrade his gas range and raise rent $25 or leave it alone? Trying to justify the increase. Your insurance is going to go up probably 30 to 50% this year. It's going up everywhere, every, everybody's. Uh, your taxes are going to increase. The uh, appraised value of properties around you have gone up. So your property value is going to look higher to your county tax assessor. We don't raise rents because we want to increase profit. We raise rents to make sure we're not losing money to increased expenses. And if they're only under by 75, um, does the range need upgraded? I think a $25 a rent increase is totally justifiable. I don't know that a $75 increase is enough to do the whole binder strategy, but I would point out, look, here's what's happening to my property taxes. It's happening to my property insurance. So uh, a $25 an hour, a $25 a month increase is, is not something that I would put much thought into. I would either just do it or ignore it. Um, you can also be human and look at the person's situation. You know, how tight do you think they are? Um, an example for one of my tenants who might be watching my video. Do not try to convince your landlord how tight money is and then go out and buy a brand new car. Because that just meant money's tight for something you don't prioritize like rent. Money is tight for me, but not for the car. So um, if you're watching, how do you? I see the car. Buddy, do you think cash out refinance will be close to comparable sales at today's inflated sales price? Do you think cash out refinance will be close? So a cash out refinance is almost always at least a half a point higher than a purchase. Uh, that's why a lot of people who think, oh, I'll just buy it cash and then do a refinance, they're gonna lose more money over time. Buying it cash to get the deal might be effective because it gets the, the seller's attention, but you're going to pay more in interest. Um, and remember banks lend on margin. If a bank gives you an interest rate of 3% and then two years later you get an interest rate of 8%, that doesn't mean that this bank is making 8% and this bank is making 3%. They're both, both making 1, 1.5%, maybe 2%. Because the Fed rate sets what you can borrow money at, at zero. So they're doing it in the 2.5 to 3. So they're getting that margin in there and they do have expenses. And then at 8%, the Fed is raising theirs. So banks are trying to figure out where the Fed's going to raise it to in, in the couple of months. So banks lead the Fed and uh, they, they, they do it on margin. And then they, they do it on, on how high a level of risk you are. So if you live in the property, you're the lowest amount of risk. If it's an investment property, the risk goes up. If your credit score is worse, the, the, the risk goes up. If your debt to income is worse, your risk goes up. So there's all these factors that can adjust what the rate is going to be. So if anybody ever tells you rates in this area are this, well, that means for their situation with their debt to income and their credit score and their, you know, their resources, um, the only way to compare interest rates is to see what different lenders at the same time would give you based on your situation. Damien, howdy. Good morning. Thank you. I'm a big fan of yours too. And Julius took back a message to make me lose sleep. Is that established 94? How did you go from property one to two? Great question. Um, it wasn't easy. I was making $17 an hour. I had $89,000 in bad debt that I didn't know about until the divorce. I had a bad debt to income ratio. I had low salary. Like I had everything stacked against me. My credit score was okay. It was in the 600s at the time. It wasn't great. Bankruptcy wasn't an option because I was working in law enforcement before then, and, and I thought I would go back into law enforcement. Um, and you can't have a bankruptcy on your record because you're more likely to take a bribe. Makes sense. So I couldn't do bankruptcy. Um, and then I talked to a lender, and they said, you know, and I, I asked the question. I said, well, how do people get, you know, five, six, seven mortgages? And they, he said, well, she said, well, they have rental income on their tax returns. I owned a house. I was I was living in it. So I moved into an apartment. 
for two years and rented out the house. The first year went stupid because I wasn't running it like a business. I rented to a friend on a handshake with no lease. I set that up for failure. But after two years of having rental income on my tax returns, your debt to income all of a sudden doesn't matter because I went to buy a duplex, the rental income from the house, which was now more than the mortgage two years later, the rental income from the other side of the duplex, because I showed a track record of being able to maintain a property, find a tenant, screen a tenant, place a tenant, collect rents, like everything it takes to own a property for two years. So I bought a duplex. Those two rents made it to where that new mortgage had zero impact on my debt to income ratio. And after that point, the lenders have told me there is no limit to how much you can borrow you are only limited by your ability to save a down payment. So if I need to buy a million dollar property, I have to save up to $250,000. If I want to buy a $100,000 property, I got to save $25,000. So how much I save opens up more and more options because it's based on down payment, not debt to income, not my salary, not my work history. Uh, although I think work history is probably still a factor for those residential loans, but it doesn't limit me and what I can borrow. So that's how I went from one mortgage to two rent out your house, go rent an apartment. It sucks. And I, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I can't live in an apartment. I have a family. How many millions of families live in apartments? And are you really better than them because you don't want to be financially free in 10 years? Or are you stupider than them? Stupider. The dumbening continues. Not sure if that's a word. <laughs> the less intelligent thing to do is to say, I can't do that because I have a family. And the right sentence is, I have to do this because I have a family. As a single parent not making a lot of money, the only way to reach financial freedom was to find a path that allowed me to buy rentals. And for me, that was renting out the house. So I went to my kids. I had three kids and I was like, hey, I think in order to buy rentals, we need to move into an apartment and rent out the house. And you know what my youngest said? My daughter was like eight at the time. Really? We need to live in a place where there's a bunch of kids in a pool that I get to play with and hang out with? Let's go. Like, I thought the barrier to doing this was going to be the kids. And my kids were like, my other daughter, I get to be the new girl at a school. Like that was a goal of hers. Like off we go. Um, so that's how I went from property one to two. Damien. And my chat moved. My accountant told me that I wouldn't be able to take advantage of depreciation because I make over $100,000. Can you elaborate? Thanks. So I think that's on... Um, your primary house. I'm not sure how that works. Uh, if you're a real estate professional, you can use depreciation to offset your W-2 income. It's actually kind of rare. There's a couple of criteria you have to hit. You have to work in real estate more than you work in your W-2. You have to work in real estate more than 751 hours. So anytime it's been audited and you have a W-2, most people lose the ability to do it. Um, there are people like Matthew Lumberjack Lumberjack Landlord who has a spouse who doesn't have another W-2, but she works in real estate. And they were able to use cost segregation to actually have a massive cap, uh, tax implication and benefit in their favor, actually. Um, so I make over 100000 and I use depreciation. But here's the thing. My W-2 job, 37% tax bracket, money goes to the government. It just goes. No write-offs, standard deduction, whatever you normally get to do. My real estate, six figures of profit, never paid a penny in, in uh, income tax on rental income because you can use depreciation against that income. Your W-2 income does not impa impact your ability to use depreciation on rental income. And the second you own a rental property, my suggestion, write this down, this is a Dionism, hire a CPA or a tax pro. There are multiple types of depreciation, scheduled, bonus, amortized, like all these words, I don't even wanna know what they mean. I don't know what they mean. It's not my job to. It's my job to get the information to the tax pro and make sure that with their skills and abilities that I'm paying for, they get me the best legal, um, where I'm only paying the taxes I'm required. And with real estate, so last year, $128,000 in profit, I carried forward an $8,900 loss towards next year, just in case I have enough profit next year to where I need to use that to offset it on passive income, which is what the IRS calls rentals, whether you consider it passive or not. I self-manage two hours a month for 16 units. So not entirely passive. It does take some time to literally count the money. Sometimes that's what takes the time. Make sure everything is paid, right? I feel like Scrooge McDuck diving around in the coins. 
Um, right, so there are some limitations on how it can impact your W-2 as far as depreciation goes, and your tax pro will tell you that, but it doesn't impact rental income. Bill, where do you, where do I find your email? I, it is below you, only five or six comments. So you've got it now. Thank you. Greg, howdy. If you mix your tequila, you're drinking the wrong stuff. John number one on the rocks. Fair enough. I, what is it? I think it was something about kamikazes that just became the drink of choice for me for several years. Um, Julius, two-part question. So I'll start with the first one. Is there a downside to having all your units on Section 8? Yes. The longest government shutdown I remember was, I think, 64 or 68 days. And Section 8 continued to pay. Had the government shutdown lasted long enough, Section 8 could have been impacted. So it's possible that 100% of your units gets tanked that way. Another one is rents go up significantly like in 2020 and 2021 in my area where they went up over 30%. My tenants saw an increase of 20 to 28% at tenants request. They asked for the rent to go up that much. Section eight didn't go up that much. So if all my units were section eight, I would have had to jump out of section eight to get current area average rents. So I would have lost, I don't know, 20, 30, $40,000 last year. I keep one third of my units in section eight. That's my goal. One third military, one third working, we're retired. So a prolonged government shutdown, pandemic, or stock market crash uh, doesn't impact my entire portfolio. So diversification of tenant base is as important to me as diversification of where my properties are. I don't want them all together. I don't want a 10 unit apartment complex if that was my whole portfolio, but I would like five duplexes spread out so that they're drawing tenants from different sources. And every time I mention this, somebody in the comments usually mentions, so I'll get in here before you. It would be illegal to advertise and say, I only want Section 8. I only want military. I, only, I won't take military or Section 8, right? So I get you would be discriminating. But I can control where I advertise. If one of my two units that's coming open next month, if I decide I want Section 8, which I probably don't because they're very far behind in rents in our area right now, I would call the housing authority and I would say, hey, here's the link to my unit that comes available next Tuesday. Can you share this with your clients? Who do you think I'm going to have apply first? If I want a military person to apply, I would go out and advertise on base. And to advertise on your base in your area, there is an agency that handles housing for your area. It's different in every location. Every installation handles it differently. But every installation will have an MWR, Morale, Welfare, Recreation. They will know who on your installation handles housing. Contact them. Say, I'd like to list. They'll tell you to contact. If you advertise on base, who do you think is going to apply to live in your property? So you can control advertising to control your diversification legally. Second part of your question. For my area, we have a lot of traveling nurses. How would you incorporate them into your rental strategy? No more than a third. Um, and only if you want short-term rentals. I currently only do long leases. Uh, email me, my email's there. There's a website if I was gonna do traveling nurses. My sister educated me now, I think almost two months ago. She's a traveling nurse. Um, and we were talking about her being in Ohio where she's being paid $2,700 a month for housing and her place is only $1,500. So it's like the owner doesn't know how much she's being compensated. So they didn't know, you know, how to maybe slightly adjust the rents. And my sister said, but if I was in Florida right now, I'd be getting eight or $900 a month for rent. And I said, why is that? Because, you know, traveling nurse is a traveling nurse, right? No, traveling nurses are paid to go where it sucks. And in the winter, Ohio sucks. And in Florida, there's a lot of people who would like to go there and be a traveling nurse there, right? So they don't have to compensate you more to be there. So she gave me a website, which I think I could just share here. If I can do this really quick. Here's a website where you can go and check what they will pay nurses in your area on your time of year. So Arizona, August, probably going to compensate you more than in January, right? Or whatever whatever the negative aspect of is of where you are, that's the time they're going to pay more. So if I was going to use traveling nurses, I would set my payment closer to based on what the nurse is going to get. If, they, if they're compensated $2,700 for housing, that doesn't mean they're going to want to pay $2,700 because they get to keep the difference. But I'd be charging more than $1,500, right? Uh, 
Um, that's how I would do that. Daniel, how much cash have you invested for down payments between all 16 units? Out of mine, so technically right now, zero, because my account has more in it than what I have invested. So all 16 units, seven properties, I my total down payments out of my money is 320000 The aggregate amount for all the down payments is a little over 600000 but the other 300 or so thousand came from cash flow. So I've recycled cash flow. So in 10 years, I've invested 320000 of my own money. Um, most of that is probably from cash flow and from avoiding life grief. It doesn't cost me very much to live. I'm still house hacking. Um, the first one, the first duplex, I had a little over 20,000, like 21 or $22,000 to the 5% down loan. Um, I used my retirement account as a reserve. So I didn't have to have more cash sitting in my accounts. Uh, it was really close. I purchased a fourplex one time. Uh, this was just before I emptied out my retirement account. So this is no longer an option to purchase the fourplex. And when I first started, remember, I've talked to him several times. I wasn't making a lot of money. I had a lot of bad debt, single parent, three kids. Like these are numbers I just couldn't imagine back then. To buy the fourplex, so the down payment, the closing costs, it needed a roof, so immediate repairs, some other things, was $141,000. And my bank account was $141,200. So on January 6, 2020, when I closed on that property, I had $200 to my name. I had to use a retirement account as a reserve. And mentally, I had a credit card, which I never carry a balance on, that had $17,000 in available credit. So I could handle an emergency if it came up. I had the retirement account if it came up. I had a W-2 still. You know, the pandemic hadn't shut us all down yet. It was January 6th. I had cash flow from, at the time, what was it? Um, when I closed on the fourplex, that took me to 11 units. So I had cash flow from seven units coming in. But I closed on January 6th. The, rent, the units of the fourplex were rented out. So I got prorated rents of almost a full month of January. And then your mortgage payment doesn't start until March 1st because you get that one month of carry where you're paying interest, but that's a 30 year from now problem, um, but not out of pocket now. So then I got the rents for February. So from January 6th to March 1st, there was over $10,000 in my reserve account again. When you're first starting out, I would never recommend going to almost broke because I had a retirement account, I had the credit card, I had the cash flow, I had the W-2, like I had the income snowball had kicked in at that point. Once the income snowball kicks in, we have a lot more options to do that. I don't know that I would wanna buy a place and go down to $200. Now, the only reason I'm thinking it would be a good thing is because if I'm buying a place that gets a 10% yield, the more money I'm investing to you know, moving from the bank into the property, the more cash flow I'm gonna be getting. So I might even do that again. Um, It'd be really weird to find a deal that was that close to literally how much money I had to my name. Uh, Lumberjack. Howdy, Matt. You know, this man has earned a thumbs up. So that is something I say during my live streams. If at some point my content earns a thumbs up, don't just hit a thumbs up because you think I'm pretty. My mom doesn't watch this. So that'd be the only person that would do that. Um, don't miss you, mom. I miss you too, dad. Um, if my content earns a thumbs up, Please hit it. Let YouTube know that somebody likes this. Johnny, howdy, real estate freaks. WT, hi, Leon. <laughs> howdy to you too. Uh, Tyler, does your 10% cash on cash return, 10% maintenance, 5% vacancy, tax, no lawn care? Yes, everything set aside. So not 10% CapEx. So 10% for maintenance and CapEx. And even in those years where I've replaced a roof, I've never spent 10%. Of, of gross rents on both of those. Um, it does 10% cash on cash. And that 10% is year one. Like that's the target goal, which so far I've hit. I've had one that got a 17 the first year. Most have like 11 to 12. One was like 10.00001. Like it was right there. Um, but by year three, most of them are 20% cash on cash return. A couple of them, I refinanced the mortgage to a better rate and the rents went up like 50%, um, almost across the board, all of them have, the rents have increased to where my average cash on cash now across the board for all, all 16 units is over 20% cash on cash return. Um, that doesn't suck. But I set aside reserves 
when I had seven or less units, I had 10,000 in reserves. Now at 16, I keep 30,000, but I also have a W-2 that makes six figures. So if I ever stop working, which <laughs> is coming, uh, if I ever stop working, that 30 is going to become 50 or 60. Then the, the less secure the income is, the higher the reserve to offset that stress. Because I sleep like a baby. Like I could have half my tenants stop paying or rents reduced by 50% and I still wouldn't have to come out of pocket to pay expenses. I feel so good to say. <laughs> so, uh, let me see here. Bolo, is there a website that you use to pull your tenant scores, background eviction? I do. I use apartments.com. They used to be, I used, when I started using it, it was cozy.co. It was a Canadian company, but they were purchased by apartments. So cozy was 30, $38 of uh, fees for tenants. Um, it's free for the landlord, free for the owner. My tenants pay $45 now for that check. So in my listings, I'm very clear to say, don't apply until we've communicated because I have some strict criteria. I, I, I require a 700 credit score. I require no evictions ever, not even in 1991. Don't care, no evictions ever. Um, so don't waste the money on an application if you don't meet the criteria because I will not approve you. Um, and then I have had people reach out and say, my credit's like a 660, but here's the story. And so, yeah, you can you can make adjustments because credit history, as is important or more important sometimes than credit score. Um, but apartments.com does that and gets you an eviction check. They give you the work uh, information. They don't verify it. Some services might verify work stuff, but I wouldn't want to verify work with the number provided by the applicant. I don't care what someone makes. It's not one of my criteria. I don't care what their income is. Because if you do that, you eliminate things like bartenders, waiters, cosmetologists, people who make the majority of their money through tips, right? And have some great tenants, and that's their occupation. I also know people making six figures who are late on every bill. So I don't care about income. I um, use apartments.com for that. And there was one other thing. And, of course, the brain. Gotta take a drink because it's you know the memory thing. Oh, the work history thing. Sorry about this. This um, <laughs> this commercial was brought to you by our sponsor tonight of Alien Vodka, which is not our sponsor. Again, to clarify. Um, the person can provide you with employment contact, which is their friend's cell phone number, and their friend knows that for a couple of weeks to answer like they're the company. So one of my last applicants um, was uh, moving to the area and working for the post office. Here's the number. Here's the bosses. All that came from apartments. I go to Google. I find the post office in that area. I contact, ask to talk to a random manager, ask to verify everything checked out because you can fake that kind of stuff. It's harder to fake credit score and it's harder to fake eviction history. But employment stuff, while apartments will gather it, I just use that to find out where they work and then I verify through um, numbers that I find myself. Okay, uh, thanks for responding to your email. I'll respond today. Awesome. Thank you. Tammy, howdy. Do you have a percent to use to price below the median rent when you do the binder strategy? I usually estimate about 10% lower. I figure that's where most people and pretty much tracks better than that. So that's a good conservative number. So if rents are 1500, I count on getting 1350. Most of them are 14, 1460, somewhere in there. 15 to 16 is the average. So 10% is, is where I estimate the binder would be less. But I'm also not doing a rehab. I don't have a vacancy while the tenant's gone. I don't have to find, screen, and place a tenant. Like there's all these much more important things that impact my time to me than that 10% I could be making if I spent all the money on that. I look forward to a tenant moving out. Like the binder strategy just works to acquire properties and to make sure my rents are competitive for me. But I have, a ten I have two tenants now moving out next month. One is buying a house and, and one is moving out of, out of the area. I look forward to it. I'll do, a, you know, one doesn't need much work. The other one's probably going to need like 10 grand or so. But I'll spend the money on that and then I'll get area average rents. And that doesn't suck, right? So I'm not displacing a tenant. I don't I don't have to lose sleep. And like I, I bought a place and they just can't afford the rent. So I have to make the move. Like that sucks as a, as a human to feel that way towards someone. So the binder strategy helps me feel 
honorable, I guess is the term. But when a person moves and it's something like they bought a house and I get to say, congratulations, that's awesome. You're on the property ladder. Best move you're ever going to make. I'm going to get more rents. That's cool. Uh, niece, howdy. Glad you made it too. Rob, howdy. Do you use electronic job application or do you use electronic applications for your rentals? Apartments.com. That's all electronic. So works out, works out great. And I've got times where people come and I've met them and they, they tell me their credit score. They tell me their eviction history. And I still go, great. Let me send you the link to my apartments.com listing for this property. So you can fill out the application. Doesn't matter who it is. Universally the same across the board. Everybody goes through that. Andrew, howdy. Just wanted to say thanks for the live streams. Thank you. Me, Mike, and Zuber, Matt and Zuber are incredible resources that keep it real for us noobs all looking to that first house hack every Tuesday. I enjoy doing the lives. I think the three of us uh, work really well together. There's three different perspectives, three different goals, three different backgrounds. Like uh, I think it works great. I'm glad we all somehow universe lined up and we all met each other. Um, I actually don't want to do live streams because of the memory issues. It's very embarrassing every time I'm like sitting here and I'm hoping it's not obvious, but I'm like, I'm in a room, there's a computer, there's some chat, I'm doing a live stream. Let's go back to the live stream. Um, and I'll say something funny like, oh, my chat moved so I can read through and look at the last thing that even looks familiar to see where I was at. Like that's, a, that's embarrassing, but I'm hoping that the information helps. And so for me, that that's my own personal struggle my actual first live stream was why I don't do live streams. And here we are 28 weeks later. Great movie. Um, still doing live streams. So I'm hoping that they help people. Rob. Um, and then my chat actually moved. <laughs> How is the 40? So I had the offer in, I think they accepted someone else's offer on the DSCR loan property. I'm in second position. So I don't currently have one in the works, but I'm going to, and it's 50, 40, 10 on the uh, loan, which is 50% comes from the lender. The seller carries a 40% note, and then I bring 10% to the table. Uh, second position, don't have it under contract. Indy, howdy. I'm excited to catch you live. I'm in the beginning, have some similarities to your beginning. So it's a huge encouragement to listen to your story. I think one of the great things is your background doesn't matter. The strategy that you pick doesn't matter. Like there's no one right way to do real estate. There is a right way for you, right? But we need to hear as a human. Yeah, Zuber has an MBA and, and, and you know, he's super educated and he can get the numbers and he gets the finances. So I watch him for his, his finance updates, right? Matt dropped out, didn't do high school. I graduated high school with a 1.1 GPA just because it was what I needed to get in the Marine Corps. Um, so our, our education levels are very different in the back. Our finances are different. Um, you know, Matt had kids way later in life. I had kids um, while I was still a kid, basically. Um, if somebody can do this, single with one income or with kids or with other barriers, then the problems that we each have seem less daunting and easier to get around to get to make investing work. Uh, so that's why sometimes I'll overshare and I'll talk about here are the times I failed. Here's how bad I was with my first tenant. Here's all that I tried to quit. I tried to give away my house the first year. I was so bad at this. Uh, luckily, I was underwater and couldn't give it away. I owed more money on the house than it was worth because of the housing crash. So the only reason I'm financially free right now is because I couldn't give the house away. Um, to let people know that when you when you have that problem or that issue, someone else has probably had it. And here's the solutions. Here's the way we got past it. Here's what the end result is. And, and that's where the humble brag comes in. Like, here's the things that we can do now in these last five years because of the crap we've put up with that most of us have to put up in the first five years is totally worth it. Ryan, when you talk about getting to four, is that for properties or for units? 
mostly when Zuber's talking about that, he's talking about four properties. That should be a goal of the first five to 10 years is get to four properties. So if you're investing in single family houses, that's four transactions to require properties. If you're in doing small multifamily, it's four transactions to get properties. So get to four deals. And that might be four or 16 units, somewhere, somewhere in there, depending on if you have all four plexes or all single family. Uh, get to one, like get that first one in under your belt. And because the first time you do anything in real estate, it's scary. The first time you pay for an appraisal and you, and you, you go, wait, I'm going to pay this person for a property I don't own yet. And I might not end up buying. And I hope that they tell me that it costs enough for me to buy it. Like that's stupid and scary and money and it's gone. And now it's like, hey, you pay the appraisal. I hope it comes in a little low because it gives me some negotiation power with that seller. Um, or if, if it's if it's really low, then an educated professional who studied this area and knows has saved me from buying a bad deal. Like those are good things. Or the same thing for the inspection. I'm going to pay for somebody to inspect something I might not close on, but they give you a to-do list and a negotiation tool. And the first time you try anything in real estate is scary. The second time, it almost feels like you could teach a course. Tammy. Howdy. When running the numbers, when you house hack, do you primarily use 20% down so you don't pay mortgage insurance? Do you ever do a house hack less than 20% down with mortgage insurance? I have house hacked twice. Once with 5% down, once with 20% down. I have a video on my channel, which I did a live stream a couple weeks ago. House hack cash flow, how to run the numbers on a house hack. If I was doing a down payment that was small or large, I'm always going to run it like I did a 25% down payment because I'm not trying to figure out how much I'm going to cash flow. I'm trying to figure out apples to apples comparing these properties, which one is the one that's worth pursuing. If you do a zero down VA loan and you make $1 in profit a year, that's an infinite return. Sounds great. Is it worth the trouble, headache, and risk of managing a tenant in a property for $1 a year? even though it's a million times yield, right? So that wouldn't work for me. So I do two things. I run it like I did a bigger down payment to compare everything equally. And I run the numbers as if it's the year after I've moved out and all units are rented out. So I take the house hack out of the equation. So it was kind of my closest clickbait video that I've got, you know, how to run the numbers on a house hack. But it's not clickbait because I told you how I do it. So I actually answered what was in the title. Take it out of the equation. If you did a down payment, and it was the year after you moved out and all units were rented, what would that property cash flow? That tells you if it's a good deal or not. The house hack we're doing because it gets us in with the lower down payment, better interest rate, like all these perks. We get to lower or reduce our housing costs. Like that's a perk, but that's not why we chose that property. Great question. Galen, what, what have you seen in the difference between conventional financing for a rental property and DSCR loan in the rate, um, about a percent, maybe a little less, three quarters of a percent. So it's a, it's a, it's a significant jump, but it's it's worth it because you rate, remember, price, rate, rents. You're looking at what the yield's going to be. Um, so if DSCR gets you into it and it's fixed rate, that's the thing that matters to me. I don't want to ever have adjustable rate loans or a loan that has a loan reevaluation period. So a 30 or 40 year fixed rate residential or DSCR, the interest rate's a little different. Um, that's where the 50, 40, 10 came into play. You can get a better interest rate that way. That looked better than the DSCR. I can actually offer more for the property and pay less uh, overall. Um, but that was what I was saying it was about a, a percent or less different with buying down the rate. But I buy down the rate either way because I'm a buy and hold. If I was going to sell a property in 10 years or less, I would probably might not buy down the rates. But since my goal is to hold them forever, I buy down the rates. Peter, howdy. Who are you using for insurance? I've got farmers and the biggest deductible deduction I can get is not well. My deductions are 10,000 and 5,000. I use Stillwater insu insurance through Geico. And every time I get insurance, I call, I call several different um, companies. Last week, my live stream or the week before now, was uh, insurance mistakes. And, and, and then the first like 15 minutes, I cover how I get my insurance quotes. So if you can check that out, it's, it's, it's uh, I should look up the name of the actual one, but it's my live stream. Just go to my channel, go to the live streams and look, you know, the last couple. 
It'll be right in there. It's 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 insurance right in the title. Indeed. I'm currently a renter, so no mortgage at this time. Would like to ask if I could buy a duplex, try a quad, a first-time home buyer loan, and house hack. You absolutely can. Um, you can buy a house in house hack and rent out the rooms. As a renter, have you ever had roommates? It's no different. Some of us are okay with roommates helping us pay someone else's mortgage, but as soon as it's our mortgage, we have a problem with it, which is weird. Um, but you can buy a house with an ADU, which will get you exactly the same lending as a single family house because it's single family. So 3% down conventional, 3.5 FHA. Um, you can do a duplex. Some local credit unions will still do a 5% down to house hack a duplex. So your ability to save the down payment. And then how much you qualify for in your area is often adjusted by how many units. So if in an area, FHA would go to $500,000 for single family, it'll probably do 550 or 580 for duplex, 630 for a triplex, 750 for, you know, whatever the math it scales up per units on what you can borrow. So step four, save credit strategy lender, talk to a lender, find out what your options are to find out how they look at small multifamily. That is the best way to do it. Matt, the lumberjack landlord has a brilliant strategy because one of the drawbacks to FHA is they don't want you to buy investment properties. You're supposed to be buying a residence, right? So if you buy a house with an FHA loan and the next year you refinance and you want to buy another house with FHA, if it's smaller and farther away from work, they won't let you. If you can justify moving from a house into a bigger house with more bedrooms, it's closer to work, there's something else that justifies it, you can use an FHA loan again. You can only have one at a time, right? But you can only, so you refinance out of the first one and then do it again. If you buy a fourplex as your first property, so if you the, the barrier is usually saving down 3.5% of a fourplex is still more than 3.5% of a single family just because they cost more. But if you can buy a fourplex, Matt's strategy is called 4321. You can use an FHA loan as long as you are moving toward a single family house or toward a larger single family house. So you buy a fourplex, then you, you, know, you live there for a year or two, you let the appreciation catch up so you can refinance out of it into a conventional, use FHA to buy a triplex, rinse, repeat, duplex, rinse, repeat, house, rinse, repeat, bigger house. By then you have enough cash flow to where you're not using FHA because remember FHA is a bad loan product. It's designed for somebody who has bad credit high debt to income ratio. So it's it's the government knows that the best thing to do for people is to get on the property ladder. One of the statistics I like to use this is their method or their, their logic to this is at retirement age, an average homeowner has an, a net worth of $221,000. An average renter has a net worth of $6,800. That's a big difference, right? So they want you on the property ladder. You have a better chance at a more successful re retirement where you're less of a burden to your kids or to society. So they're encouraging home ownership. FHA is designed to get people on the property ladder who have credit issues, debt to income issues. So if you can use conventional, my goal is to always use conventional because you don't have to go 4321. You can go 424143. It doesn't matter. Um, your down payments are a big factor. A conventional loan on single family is 3% for your first one, which means you haven't owned a property for three years. 5% on properties after that. So you can rinse and repeat buying single family houses with conventional loans owner occupied at 5% down. Small multifamily, when I first purchased my duplex, they would let you do 5% down. Triplex and fourplex, sometimes they wanted 15 or 10 or whatever the current thing is. You have to check with lenders what is the current um, requirements. But I just did a deal deep delve about a month ago with Kevin and Brett where they did a 5% down conventional loan on a duplex with a local credit union. So it's still currently in 2022, a thing. Um, yep. Tom, glad you're still here, Tom. So glad your first tenant thinks he's woke. Thank God for the three L's, lease laws and good lawyers. <laughs> This guy's forgot the water in the kitchen. Well, yeah, you told me about this. Got the water in the kitchen running when he went out. But at least I remembered and got a ride back home to turn it off, but didn't clean up the mess. So you have a choice there. You either charge them for the cleanup and any damage that was done, or you take note of it. And when they move out, that comes out of the deposit. Dividend Dave. As I know, you can't take depreciation on non-rental residents. Right. So your primary, you don't. That's why you want a tax pro. My original house hack was a duplex. So I couldn't use depreciation on 
50 percent because i was only occupying half half of the depreciation was allowable i now currently house hack a fourplex so 25 percent because that's where i live is not used in the depreciation schedule the the cpa has to worry about all that kind of stuff i just know that um it's almost like Congress is full of people who own a bunch of properties and keep making rules and laws that benefit people who own properties. So weird. What are the odds? Uh, Tom, I planned on removing the carpet and hardwood floors and installing LVP, and now he gets to pay for it. Okay, perfect. Johnny, if you're watching, howdy. I see the car. <laughs> yep, I do see the brand new car on the person who is going to have a binder conversation in about a month. Um, dividend Dave, the $25,000 he's referring to may be ordinary losses from passive active, like a rental after a hundred thousand income. It gets reduced by $1 for every $2 above a hundred thousand. See, we have smart people in the audience. This is the beautiful part of this. Um, Matt will say he's uneducated because he went, you know, ninth grade dropout. His exponentially smarter than him than me L listen to him talk sometime and you realize how smart he is i'm not that smart and you can do this if you're not that smart like like that's my superpower average the average person can do everything that i've done by hiring somebody who's as smart as dividend day my cpa my tax guy um, and then tipping them don't worry about how much you're spending on that. That that is saving you tens of thousands, if not more, money in doing your taxes right. And the stress release of, I have a spreadsheet. I put my income here. I put my expenses here. I send it off, and that is the totality of what I do for taxes. Um, Tyler, howdy. I'm a real estate pro, and I qualify to use it offset your wife's high income job. We have 11 houses. Every accountant will have. Different numbers of houses they think you can need. Mine says six. Tyler, I don't work at all. Just deal with real estate. Yeah, so so that why is why it works for you. That's why it works for Matt's spouse. And I would never say she doesn't work at all. I would say she doesn't have a W-2, which is probably for you too. Because self-managing those units is a job. And raising the kids while doing that. It's crazy. Uh, Julius, thank you. Don, howdy. Ronnie, howdy. When do you think is a good idea to use FHA loan? When it's your only option to get on the property ladder. So if you have a triplex or a fourplex and you want to do 3.5% down and most lenders are wanting a lot more, that is a significantly large, significantly huge difference. Words are hard. That is a significant difference between 3.5 and 15% down or whatever you're going to be doing. Um, if your credit and debt to income ratio are off, but it's the only way to get into it. But here's the drawbacks with FHA. Mortgage insurance, half of it is paid up front. It lasts the entire length of the loan. So the only way to ever get rid of mortgage insurance on an FHA loan is to refinance, sell the property, or pay off the loan, right? Pretty sure those are the only three. There might be another one, bank robbery, but that puts you in prison, which is the ultimate house hack. Um, I prefer conventional. If you put down 20% or less, you're going to have mortgage insurance. As your equity position grows, and you hit, as soon as you hit 22% interest, your mortgage insurance goes away automatically. They say automatically. I would still check with your lender to make sure it happens. Um, yeah. So FHA is not my first option, but it sometimes is a good option. There is a video on my channel called FHA versus conventional. Kind of gives you the different options. Um, Matthew, howdy. Mike's been talking a lot about his new 50-40-10 loan. Do you know how lenders treated the 40% second loan when qualifying for your 50%? You did. So it's it, the 40% is going to be in your debt-to-income ratio. But if you're buying rentals, remember debt-to-income ratio almost doesn't matter. The first two years of starting to invest before you have rental income on your tax returns, debt to income ratio is a huge factor because they don't want you to overextend yourself, over leverage yourself, or set yourself up for failure. Once you have a track record of two years of getting rental income, screening tenants, placing tenants, maintaining properties, getting that income. And here's the really cool thing. Last year, and, and I, transparent numbers, profit, walk away with after 
Principal interest taxes insurance, setting aside for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy. I self-managed, so I didn't set aside for property management. $128,000 in profit. Carried forward an $8,900 loss, right? So it looks like I lost $8,900 last year. So you'd think it would make it really hard to buy the next property, right? And my debt to income would look terrible. I have all these rentals, but I'm losing money. So how do you buy properties? I guess I have to sell them all and buy some crypto. Or the lenders will take out the depreciation. The magical benefit to our taxes is that we get to depreciate the buildings over time, showing that loss on paper. In reality, the lenders aren't stupid and they take that out and they realize that I actually made $128,000 in profit. That's how they're able to factor in the next purchase. Um, so your debt to income ratio of the 50, 40, 10, it's like you're borrowing 90% in your debt to income ratio, but they're going to factor 75% of your rents in that. So as long as you're buying a cash flowing property, this shouldn't be adding to your debt to income ratio in a negative way. It should be neutral or improving it. Um, kind of like when a VA person, my, I'm going, I've saved a down payment, I'm going to buy a property, and then I'm going to use my VA loan because I haven't used it yet, and buy another property, another fourplex, 100% financed, probably wrap the closing costs in if the sellers aren't paying them by then because that's what's happening is the fear of missing out switches over to the seller's side as they might start paying closing costs again. But I'm going to have 100% finance property, which is still going to keep my overall leverage position far below 70%. Because right now I was doing the math the other day. I think I'm at like 40% leveraged as appreciation keeps happening. Um, that doesn't suck. You did ask it right. Peter, thank you. Indy, oh, out of my chat. I have much to learn and many questions. I'm I'm hoping that you show up for a lot of questions. That is how these live streams go on. And there will be questions I don't know the answer to. And I'll say, this is a great question for Millennial Mike because he invested a distance. This is a question for Matt the Lumberjack because he's actually done these rehabs or whatever question you have that I don't have an answer to, I'll know who to send you to. Matthew, does Matt the mortgage guy count the 40% seller note against you? Yep, see, so they do, because it's a loan you're going to be taking. But again, everything I just said in the last couple of minutes. Chester, take a sip every time you draw a blank. That is actually what I did during the uh, um, keynote speech. I took a bunch of one rental at a time and 15 conversations with real estate millionaires. And... Uh, Every time my mind went blank, I was like, hey, I'm going to give away a book. And then I would give away a book to somebody in the audience. And I think it covered for it pretty well. But if I took a sip every time I drew a blank, the last hour of these live streams would be pretty entertaining. <laughs> Tom. Hi, Andy. Just saw you on the Facebook. Nice. Matthew. Excuse me, Mr. Lumberjack. I'll be the one who decides who has to earn my thumbs up. You get two from you. Nice. Matthew. Should have been three to put you back where you started. Exactly. That's why I always say, if you hate my content, hit the thumbs down. But hit it twice so I know for sure that you hated it. Angel, you did. Thank you. <laughs> Sebastian, howdy. Love your content. Thank you. How did you like Columbia? Columbia was awesome. Um, I went to Hot Springs that was like a six-hour drive in the middle of nowhere that were beautiful. Uh, what I really liked about Colombia was they still like Americans. And there's not that many countries you can go to where that's a thing. Um, people were super nice. I went during Santa Semana. <laughs> so white redneck raised in Southern California goes to Colombia and sees 500 KKK members with the hood and the pointed everything walking down the street. That was my reaction. I mean, I took a minute to watch and realize it was it was a parade and it was a religious, that was how their monks dressed or however the whatever the whatever the culture was. But for that split second, I was like, oh my God, there's a KKK rally going on in Colombia. What have I walked into? And and Colombia has kind of a bad reputation from the 70s when there was all these cartel problems. And I'm sure that there's still problems like that. And everyone warned me, you're going to Colombia, you're going to be at super risk. While I was in Colombia, a friend's kid was robbed in Tacoma at gunpoint here in Washington. Um, and the closest I saw to anything weird in Colombia was these two taxi cab drivers going at it with a screwdriver over a fare. 
<laughs> so there were the federales or the, the government people with machine guns walking everywhere. It felt safe everywhere you went. Cartagena was amazing. Um, beautiful waters. Scuba was great. I got shredded on a mermaid statue. I wanted to go up to the mermaid statue and the water was messing with me. So I went around to the other side and got up on it. And then the water literally raked me back and forth over Reba. It was awesome. It's a great experience. Um, the one, there was a couple things with with uh, Columbia that were weird. Uh, hard, to, hard to adjust. First, the KKK rally that I saw. Second was, you guys don't do any seasoning in your food. Like, there wasn't even salt and pepper. And uh, my friends were there, could take a jalapeno and touch their cheek and it would swell up because they're like allergic to spices. So I had to find like a store, 7-Eleven, convenience store type thing, buy Tabasco and take it everywhere we went. Uh, and so in Colombia or Thailand, what I found is you find the Irish pubs, you find seasoning, you know, seasoned food. So some, it's not that it was bland. It was just that why do, do Colombians not do spice? So counterintuitive because I grew up in Southern California. I worked in the onion fields, literally onion fields with my mom. I was eight working in the onion fields. Um, and everything was super spicy. Everything had peppers in it. Everything would make you cry, make you sweat, make you feel good. Like the whole point of spices to make you feel good. I did not expect that when I got to Columbia. So weird. I'd like to go back. If I go back, it'll probably be to Cartagena because I like water. I want to, I didn't get a chance to look at Medellin um, as an expat option. I just know that there's a bunch there. Um, but I think it was landlocked. And to me, that's, I don't know. I, I don't know geography either because I went to school in America and they don't teach us stuff. Um, yeah. Tony. Howdy. I'm in the midst of my first deal. The roller coaster of emotions in this deal is worse than Mr. Freeze at Six Flags. I bet. Your future self will thank you. Galen, Tammy, talk to a broker. There's a program right now going where primary residents, you have to put 10% down and it does not have PMI. Nice. Always check with your lenders on what your best options are. Buddy, thanks so much for the help. I've been trying to catch these sessions for the past few weeks. Awesome. Tom, have I told you lately how much I appreciate you? <laughs> No, I appreciate you too. I appreciate you coming to all of these. I appreciate everybody that shows up. Um, it's like a therapy session for me. I, I, I run a company that has about 60 staff. I interact with thousands of people getting their CDL every year. Um, two of our staff have invested in real estate. No one wants to talk about it. No one cares. They, it's, it's like 99% of the people I interact with, 0.9% want to work until they die. And they think so, so security is going to be a thing. And having $20,000 in a 401k is going to matter. Very frustrating. So to interact with people who can benefit from this, who might actually take action on this. Um, something I said on Michael Zuber's channel the other day is sometimes people reach out and they go, hey, I'm really, really new to this. I'd like to pick your brain. I'd like to ask you some questions. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. I totally understand that. Like, I wish I had the time to do that with everybody. Here's my email. Hit me with some questions. I'll hit you with some answers. Here's when I do my live streams. Please come ask questions because it's going to help somebody else. It gives me something to talk about, right? And, and then sometimes I talk to somebody and, and I know that I'm, I'm talking to the blank wall, that they're, they're not going to take any action. They're not going to do anything. And this guy, um, Zhao, reached out like a year ago in the area. He said, hey, can we go to lunch? And I just had a free day. And I was like, sure, if you're, if you're new to the area, let's go meet for lunch. Went to lunch. He asked a bunch of questions. It was it was the normal, how does house hacking work? How do you run the numbers? How does all this kind of stuff? And then when we left, I thought that's probably the last I was going to see him. And then we go to a meetup because we do this Tacoma Fi meetup once a month here. And he shows up and he's like, all right, Dion. So I bought a, a duplex. I'm house hacking. This is how everything's working. What's my next step? And I, and I got excited because I was like, not only am I interacting with somebody who wants to hear about this kind of stuff. So I get, I get to have my therapy session, but they're taking action. So like when I met Tony this last weekend and he traveled to me to ask questions, we go over his situation. I look forward to somebody who took that much energy and effort to do this in three or four months, learning about the steps he's actually taken. 
uh, I appreciate all of you. Matthew. Map strategy works with VA as well. Yep, I did this last year and now I have two VA loans and still have enough allowance to purchase another if I so desire. If I could justify the third property. Yep, the 4321 is for owner-occupied um, FHA, VA. That was a great clarification. Well, very useful for that. And a lot of people don't realize that you can have more than one VA loan. Today's sponsor, Alien Podcast. Uh, let me see. Take a sip every time you lose your place. <laughs> Everybody come back for the last hour. Tom, has anyone else here had an issue getting randomly unsubscribed from channels such as Dion, Matt, and Mike's? All I noticed. Yeah, um, so Tom messaged me earlier. He was unsubscribed from all of our channels, which is... So the YouTube algorithm has a thing where if you haven't looked at a channel for so long, which I know that's not true, Tom, because you're here at almost every one of the lives, um, or if you've been in, 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 if the channel's been inactive, they can uns, un, unsubscribe you. Um, and what is my subscription at? Because every now and then it does go down a number, and I'm pretty sure it's either somebody saying, "I'm out of here," <laughs> but uh, sometimes it's that YouTube unsubscribes them. Let me see where subscribe count uh, 9670 so working on 10,000 we'll get there uh, might dye my hair a different color when we get to 10,000 um, worked for Mike right um, Christoph howdy what's a non QM loan I keep hearing Michael Zuber bring it up but it must have missed him giving the definition and never looked it up again so there's several versions of non QM so a QM qualifying mortgage is where they look at you not the property they go what's your credit score what's your debt to income ratio what's your work salary income so what we can you borrow what's your work history do you have two years consecutive in the same industry whether it's different companies or the same one so you qualify for the mortgage Non-QM is when they look at the property or you just get a line of credit. That's a non-qualifying loan. They're not looking at your, um, they'll still look at your credit score most times. But they're not looking at your debt to income ratio. They're not looking at your, uh, how long you've worked at your work history, your income or anything like that. So asset base can be non-QM, uh, DSCR, where it's the debt service structure of the property, which usually is the same as asset based. It's non-QM. So that's what those mean. Loans that aren't looking at you as much as they're looking at the property. And Dividend Dave. I do tax prep and tax planning for work, but I'm still learning. Nice. Matthew. Never save the change back for the deposit. Never say, okay, the a tenant who isn't willing to fork over the damages they are responsible for will not likely leave the property in good condition knowing they aren't. That is true. But if you keep a well-documented list of what was damaged, you can uh, pursue beyond the deposit if you need to. And it depends on the, the tenant. And do you really care? So, yeah, most I have a tenant this that's leaving this month. I believe they're getting their full deposit. I don't think that there's anything. There's LVP floor, so there's no, there's nothing to do. I might do some, you know, minor paint, fix the holes wherever they hung anything, but I, I prefer to just give their whole deposit. Kaylin, Dion, I saw and heard the, the 104010. Would you please break it down? What exactly these numbers mean? So the lender is going to give you 50% loan towards the property. And whenever you're borrowing on a property, you can borrow often up to, let's say, if they require 25% down, really what that means is they'll lend up to 75% of the loan, right? Well, if you put 50% down, if you actually put 50% down, 50% LTV or loan to value is, is the lowest bracket, best interest rates for their loans. So that's why you want to lock it at 50 so that the lender can give you the best interest rate. 40% is carried by the seller. So they're going to get a seller's note where they can either have 30-year fixed rate debt at 1% interest or 2% interest, where they just continue to get payments. Or you can give them a 5 or 10-year where you make a balloon payment by refinancing out in 5 or 10 years. You have all kinds of different options for that. So really, it's a form of seller financing, but only for 40%. 10% down because the lender wants to make sure you have some skin in the game. 
that 10% comes from you. Tom, does Velocity or Convoy do builder land development loans? I do not know. I would, I would have to ask. Uh, and if they don't, they would know who to refer you to. So I, I have no clue. Sean, do you see any real estate side hustles? My real estate portfolio is a side hustle. It's a six figure side hustle, but I work in it less than two hours a month. So to build it, it took a lot more than, you know, two hours a month to build the side hustle. But once it's in place and you have your systems in place and you have dialed in properties, two hours a month is, is plenty to manage them. That's a side hustle. I don't know that working as a real estate agent has any benefit as an investor. If it did, more real estate agents would be investors. 90% um, of real estate agents never own one rental property. Um, an inspector, I'd rather pay a pro. Uh, roofer, I'd rather pay a pro. Like all of these things that you could do, lending, all of that, I'd rather pay the pro. I'm, I'm an investor, not an entrepreneur. So if you're looking for a job, there are several jobs you can do. I think probably the best benefit you can do is work for a property management company for a period of time as an actual employee. Learn the rules and regulations, what works, what doesn't work, get that down so that you can run your properties better. I didn't do that, but I think that's one thing that you can benefit from. So tons of side hustles there. Uh, none that I've used because of the lazy. My side hustles are internet gaming and sell things, provide expert testimony, which means talk about my experiences, training experience, and what is reasonable for the average person in that field to know, um, and save a down payment move the money from a bank into a property and then live on the cash flow or save the cash flow and buy the next property. Matthew, been burned by tenants who knew the deposit was going to be changed, charged back. They don't clean, try skipping the last month, et cetera. Never again for you. They aren't willing to pay damages. They can kick rocks. That's, that's a good call. But like I said, if you remember the exact moment when I said it, or you can be human and have compassion and do it that way. To me, it's the same as I just covered the expense, right? But I'm going to take it out of their deposit. So half a dozen in one hand, purple in the other. Uh, Boye, howdy. Can you move every year to utilize 5% down payments to build a rental portfolio? Yes. Conventional loans, 5% down. It, it's not re restricted like FHA or VA where you, you have to be moving towards a single family or towards a bigger single family. So you can rinse and repeat forever um, up until 10 in your name. Once you have 10 in your name, you can no longer do residential conventional lending. Then they usually want you to go DSCR, asset-based, non-QM, one of the other options that are out there. Portfolio, bundle a bunch of them up to take away the 10 that are in your name. You have a ton of options, but that is a future you problem. Like I'm not even there yet. After 10 years of investing, I only have six mortgages and seven properties. Uh, so I still have four more mortgages I can get before I have to start worrying about that. One of the benefits to house hacking, one of the beautiful things is I, I, you can do low down payments. Again, I didn't on my second one. You can, I prefer to do higher down payments because it gives you a better equity position, increases your cash flow. It, it even improves what house hacking is doing. So the real benefit to me for house hacking was the lower interest rate and living for free, reducing or eliminating that highest expense. Uloa, howdy. Should keep my rentals under your name. I keep all of mine in my name. If you need to use hard money, you might re be required to get an LLC. If you have partners, I recommend getting an LLC. There's a video on my channel called LLC Rant. Why you probably, well, no, I didn't say probably. <laughs> I was ranting. Why you don't need an LLC. There are no tax benefits at all whatsoever. There is no asset protection unless you have partners. It creates more problems, makes your insurance cost more, makes your interest rate cost more, makes lending worse, makes refinancing worse, makes uh, you more likely to get sued because people think businesses have deep, deeper pockets than people do. Like there's this long list of reasons why I don't have an LLC. Um, each situation is different. Uh, the video is why you don't need an LLC. Check that out. Matthew, that's a great question. It comes up often and, and uh, it actually really upsets me because so many people say you have to have an LLC because of the tax benefits. Well, there are none. The IRS in 1996 actually determined all LLCs, all single member sole proprietorship LLCs are literally called disregarded entities 
they don't exist. The counties I invest in, they don't pierce the veil with single member LLCs. They are disregarded based on precedents from the IRS determining all single member LLCs are disregarded entities. So they don't exist for asset protection. Um, but people will say, you have to have an LLC. So then the new investor goes, well, I, what would I name it? Okay, so that takes up mental power. Um, how do I how do I get it? Okay, so I've got to research. Um, well, I got to fund it. And of course, a CPA that's going to get paid to file taxes on each one of your entities is going to encourage you to have it. An attorney who gets to charge because of each of your LLCs and the, the structure of it, because now you can't file for an eviction if it's in an LLC. You must be represented if you're in court, if your properties are under an LLC. You can't represent yourself. You can't even file for yourself. So there's all these things that make their jobs more secure. So imagine that CPAs and attorneys will tell you you need an LLC. So new investors sit back and they go, I don't have an LLC. I don't know how to name it. I don't want to spend the money creating it. I don't even know how it works. They don't even own a rental yet. Like, look at all the problems they created that they don't even have a rental. Get to four properties, get the cash flow, and then sit back and think, okay, do I want to waste? Absolutely throw money away every year so I can sleep a little better having my properties in this nice, cute, little structured, um, what do they call it? Multi-level LLC, whatever you want to do it. Series LLC. Knock yourself out. But that new investor... It's like they're getting kicked in the teeth by people that are telling them they need an LLC when it does nothing that they think it will and creates a bunch of barriers that they might not have anticipated. So, good question. Matthew, Tom, it's just as it sounds. Charging the deposit for repairs you covered out of pocket or cash flows. Jonathan, howdy. Hey man, how you doing? Do you calculate your property before buying in a blank sheet or what do you use? I love to use this. This is the CDS, like Chandler David Smith, because that's the guy who made it, rental calculator app. It's free in the app store. I'm actually taking his course right now, Chandler David Smith's course, and I'm going to do a review of it after it's done. So you can go in here, put in the property price, your down payment, what your interest rate is, how many years you're gonna pay it off, what your expenses are, um, at the bottom, you hit run the numbers. It'll tell you what your yield is. Obviously, that's a deal I'm not going to pursue because you're going to lose. Uh, cash on cash return is negative infinity. So no bueno. I obviously don't have the numbers put in there correctly on that. But that is the CDS rental calculator app. Um, hang on, I have 15 messages. Okay. Fire, flood, or blood. None of them are on there. Um, every time you lose your place, you drink a drink. So that's what I use. A, that uh, If you're a Bigger Pockets Pro member, I recommend using theirs because if you have a spouse, theirs is got really nice looking charts and, and it just looks way more professional. So if you need to uh, show up a um, potential partner or your spouse or somebody, this is the deal we want to go for. The bigger pockets um, rental calculator stuff works way better. But for a single person where you just want to know what is my yield, what's my amortization schedule going to look like, all of those kind of things, CDS rental calculator app. Tom and Matthew, thank you, no problem. Matthew, dang it, you made me forget your measurement. <laughs> Measure three times, cut once. And I've cut this rope three times and it's still too short. Laura, Semana Santa. There you go. See, I knew I was butchering that. Semana Santa. Matthew Paris. Nice. Installing with me in the background. Okay. Stephen, prison is the ultimate house hack. It is. You get benefits, you get food, you get a place to sleep, all the sex you don't want. It's kind of like high school. Um, and howdy, Stephen. Howdy. Army phaser? <laughs> pew, pew. As usual. You're two hours late. That's okay. We're still going. What a lot of... So you are at the two hours and 19 minutes point. So if you ever were to watch this again, that's you know, so you know where you were at. A lot of times if I'm going to a live stream and I'm late, I'll, I'll go to the live stream, I'll put it on double speed, and then I'll watch or listen until it catches up and then it switches back to normal speed. Uh, Matthew, 
Steve, those are facts. Not when you showed up, it's what you learn while you're here. Awesome. All right, wealth said to Matthew. Lori, howdy. I'm just starting out, bought two tax deed properties, own free and clear. One is abandoned, other has a person in it. Awesome. Um, so now, now what you have is called a burn rate. Every month you're going to have expenses, whether it's the utilities to the places, the property taxes that are accruing while you owe them, utilities, anything that you're having an expense on that isn't the repairs. Like those are those are actual, you know, one one off things. So the, the longer it takes you to get those up and running and rented out, the more it's going to cost you over time. So now you're on a time clock to get that all taken care of. And I think I missed a line here. No, oh, there we go. Cool. Tax liens are interesting because you, you're you're taking over problems, and then your your problem your your job now is to solve those problems. The person in there, do they have a lease? Are they paying rents? Do they need to be evicted? The the one that's vacant, how trashed is it? What needs to be fixed to make it rent ready? Uh, those kind of things. Buddy, any tips on moving into larger commercial residential deals? Brokers don't really seem interested to talk. So when you say larger, it depends on what you mean. I've always limited myself to four units or less because I like 30-year fixed rate debt, at least until you have those 10 mortgages in your name. Recently, I'm finding DSCR, you know, non-QM loans, like Convoy Home Mortgage or this gentleman that I met this weekend. Uh, Convoy will do up to eight units, 30 or 40-year fixed rate debt. So I've expanded my search to include that. I don't want adjustable rate mortgages, and I don't want a loan reevaluation period. In seven or 10 years, you might have a year where some people don't renew their leases or your cash flow doesn't look great because of something like a pandemic or a war or whatever that could probably never happen in our lives, but it's possible. Um, and you're not allowed to refinance. So you have a choice. You either have to sell the property, probably take a loss, or write a big check to the lender to offset the gap that they want you to have. Um, so that's why I've stayed at currently four units or less and now eight units or less and brokers you're you have yeah good question on finding a lender i mean there's lenders out there that want to do it but you have to have the deal then find the lender not the other way around so if you're looking for houses you go to a lender you find out what i can do and then you go out and find a house that meets the criteria if you're looking at larger commercial deals you have to find the place where the net operating income would make sense to a lender find the deal and then find a lender so you do it in reverse so they might not want to talk to you until you have the deal. Army Phaser, I just came back from inspecting a potential new rental. So I guess that is a valid excuse. <laughs> Beautiful. Hope it went well. Matthew, thumbs up to Dion getting blitz during live stream. Let's see if we can keep him here until he doesn't know his name. You mean Easter? Oh, so that was, uh, that's it was for Easter? Was it Easter? I think there you go. Okay. I was raised Catholic. You think I would know when Easter was, um, but not so much anymore, but not today. Christoph, how do you handle lawn care at your properties or do you just let the tenants maintain? Do you see any benefits to taking the yard upkeep either yourself or paying someone? Um, super lazy. I'm not looking for a job. I want to spend less than two hours a month managing all 16 units. So I do not do the lawn care, not even at the place that I live. That would be not that would be an inefficient use of my time on um, my single family house and my small multi-families duplexes and triplex all of the tenants are responsible for their specific area it's written into the lease at the fourplex where the yards aren't as clearly defined i pay about 200 dollars a month um depending on when the weekends line up it might be a little more one month and then a lot less during the winter like nothing from you know september till i think we did our first mow last week i'll do 200 dollars a month for <clears throat> those months and it's just factored into the cash flow for the property um definitely pay a pro but that's a me thing if it's cathartic for you to go out and walk behind and water put earbuds in and listen to a a podcast you're going to listen to the podcast anyways you could use the exercise absolutely save the 200 bucks do it yourself um but i uh worked in the onion fields when i was eight but my family business is tree service. My dad and both of my brothers owned tree services. My dad literally worked on the tree service till he was 75 and died on the job. Um, my one brother ran a tree service, bought 10 rentals, paid them all off, shut his business down at 50 and has been retired now for seven years. Beautiful life. My other brother still running a tree service. 
I was the youngest of the family. The slave labor. Drag brush, set rope, set your own choker, run the skitter, run the chipper, run the, the everything that sucked. That was my job. Uh, I joined the Marine Corps. One of the contributing factors to joining the Marine Corps is because that was so much easier than tree work. So when people ask me if I have PTSD, it's yes. <laughs> I've been married twice and I did tree work as a kid. Like that's my stressors. Uh, combat zone, no problem. I was like literally an army of us facing this way, enemy in front of us, no stress there. You knew what to blow up. Uh, my, my stress comes from, I don't ever want to mow a lawn or cut a tree or drag brush or rake a yard. Um, yeah, $200 a month, bargain. <laughs> That's your overshare for the moment. Uh, Julius, do you pay your handyman a flat rate per month or to be on call or per job? Also, how many did you go through before you found the one that you trust? I have two to three that I trust. I'm always looking for more. I base it on reviews. I use them on a couple of smaller jobs where I just, you know, I get a sense of their work. I watch their work. Uh, I've got three great ones. One got a full-time job, so I might be losing him. I don't pay a flat monthly rate to make them on call, but every time, so, so just like, like last week, tenant sends a message and a picture, here's a cabinet. It's laying on the floor, that doesn't seem right. I'm like, all right, call the handyman. There's a cabinet that needs repaired. He goes out, it's a whole rebuild of this section in the middle, new new door, new bracketing, they found the hardware that matched, like spent all this time there, sends me a thing, says, it'll be 200 bucks, thanks, got it done in one afternoon. So I sent him 300 bucks. Almost every time the tip is 50 to $100. Depending on the job, if it's really small, it might be 50. If it's really big, it's gonna be more. So I've never had a handyman not reply to a text, not reply to a call. Very rarely, like one or two times were they not able to get there quick. So I was like, all right, cool. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call my other guy, but I'll get you next time. And they're like, okay, no worries. And then they had to go to the other handyman. So I always keep at least two available. Um, Local REI meetups is a great way to find handyman because you get a face-to-face -face review from other instruct investors that are there. Um, anything big that would go into the electric panel or on the roof is, is gonna be a licensed contractor with insurance specific to that type of work. So then I'd go with contractor that I would get off the Thumbtack app. So I don't generally keep those. I do have an electrician and a roofer now that I would probably call, but I would still, if it was a bigger deal, I would still get a couple of uh, estimates. Mackenzie, howdy. How was your time in Florida? Do you foresee yourself going there again in the near future? I probably will. I have some friends that live there. Um, trying to figure out when the best time to go back is. Uh, not sure. Um, my next trip is probably going to be Thailand. My brother and I were planning to go to Russia this year. I think those plans have changed. Um, yeah, so the next one's probably Thailand. But after that, I might do Florida again. I enjoyed it. It was great. Um, waters near Cape Coral are pretty muddy. There, there must be some plant somewhere around there or something. But north and south of there, the waters were great. Uh, didn't get to see the massive shark migration that everybody was sending me pictures of. <laughs> um, Sean. Did you say you sell things on the internet? Can you elaborate? Well, so currently I still do affiliate marketing. I'm not really selling it, but I'm making money. But for several years, I was a single parent with three kids and, and you know, you need a hobby, right? So if I went fishing, there'd be time away from the kids. It would be an expense. If I uh, went to bars and drank, you know, that, that has a whole issue that can come with it, right? So you just need this hobby. So my hobby was online gaming. I mostly played EverQuest, World of Warcraft, way back in the day, Ever, um, Ultima Online. And there are virtual things that exist in those games that take a lot of time and effort to get, and they're kind of boring. But it's part of the game. I figured out that people on eBay and different websites would buy those things because they had the money, and that way they could play the parts of the game they enjoyed, but have the resources from the boring stuff. And I, on average, made three or $400 a month just by playing a game. Um, I quit playing EverQuest because at one point, here's another overshare. I blame the alien. Uh, when I went through my divorce, not only did I find out about a bunch of debt in my name that I didn't know existed, right? But I was one of those spouses that let my spouse handle all the bills. Three months, she hadn't paid the mortgage, the electric bill, 
the water bill, that like nothing was paid. Uh, so I took everything I had in EverQuest that I had gained over years of playing and sold it all at once. And it was like almost six grand. That amount of money covered almost every expense, got me current on bills. But it crushed me. And I've never been able to log into EverQuest since that day. I just sold everything. I was like, nope, I don't do that anymore. So I moved to World of Warcraft. Literally nerding out is why I was able to keep my house through a divorce. Um, so... You know how people do couch flipping or you you find something on Facebook Marketplace, you take it, you clean it up a little, you fix it, you put it back for a real amount. It's basically like that, but with virtual things that don't even exist. Uh, Matthew, I appreciate your comment earlier about your total portfolio debt to equity with 70-30 with 100% funded VA. I believe you should debate Mike on this topic. I don't know that we would debate. I think... He has the goal of being between 50 and 70% leverage as well. And that's my goal. And he he would he's actually talked with me before about, yeah, if you use your VA loan and it's 100% leverage, in your overall leverage position, it still keeps you below 70%. So I could, could be a topic for the, the three amigos to go, you know, what is the good leverage position? And it would base on, in your first couple of years, most of us were over levered. We were closer to 100%. I did 5% down on a duplex, which meant that was a 95% finance deal, right? Um, but as you get further in, you want the stability. You want to be able to have, because in the beginning, if a tenant doesn't pay rent, yeah, you pay the rent, right? You have one mortgage, you pay the mortgage. But when you have, um, so my mortgages, principal interest taxes and insurance is about, $8,400 or something like that. That's a lot of money to come out of pocket, right? If they all just stop paying rent. So I want a higher levered position to where I have over $24,000 a month in rent coming in. And if half stopped paying, I would, yeah, so that would take me down to $12,000 a month coming in. I would still be able to pay the mortgages. I'd still be able to set aside the almost $3,000 a month that I would put into the reserve account. So my actual cash flow is, is better than $14,000 a month. I just factor that uh, 10% for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy, you know, and 5% for that, and 15% total. Um, it's like you should buy some rentals. <laughs> this cash flow is crazy. Um, Ronnie, howdy. Uh, the 10% cash flow you are looking for is after deducting 50% the emergency and vacancies after. Cash flow is what's left including future expenses. So when my reserve account is full, I keep $30,000 in the reserve account now. It's full. <laughs> a lot. It's full 10 times? 13? No, it's full 12 times. So that doesn't mean that the $3,000, like whatever the 15% the is, mm -hmm. that would go into that account is now mine to spend because the reserve account is full, right? Because that means I would need that money so that if there ever was an emergency, I now have to give up part of my lifestyle to refund it. But that 15% that would go into the reserve when it's full now goes to the investing pile. Then the saving for the next investment happens faster. And if that $30,000 ever dipped down, then that 15% that from gross rents would be funneled back into that account until it was full again. Um, a lot of people mess up with cash flow and they go, mortgage and rents, what's the difference? Principal interest, taxes, insurance, set aside for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy and property management if you have it. What's left is cash flow. And on bigger pockets, sometimes they clarify it with pure cash flow. But to me, cash flow should just mean what you have in your pocket, kind of like what's your net worth. Um, so I have $1.8 million in debt. And this is something I need to make a video on because of a question that keeps coming up in Facebook where people go, how can you talk about having a net worth over $3 million if you have $1.8 million in debt? Like, how can you have a net worth that's positive if you have almost $2 million in debt, right? Well, the property values aggregate of all the properties is well over $5 million. So if I take out the 1.8 million and then I take what's left, I would have more than more than $3 million in net worth, right? I have to pay taxes and I have to pay agent fees. I'm gonna lose 8% or so to selling all the properties and I have to pay taxes. What's left is why I don't say that I have already got a $3 million net worth. It's coming up on 3 million. It's like 2.7 right now. But what's left after you sell everything and pay the expense of selling? Agents are going to make their money. Government's going to take their share. What would be left? That's net worth. A completely fictitious number that means nothing because who's going to sell everything for all cash and just walk away with cash? Net worth is something I'm only aware of because I make content and I made some videos on what happened first. 
million dollars in net worth or a million dollars in debt. And I just did my first personal financial statement, which was something needed for the DSCR loan, which none of my residential loans have needed, where I literally had to list out properties, values, debt structure, and it showed me what the, the net worth was, which looks like more than $3 million. But agent fees and taxes would adjust it to where I'm not there yet. Um, Laura. And again, if I ever miss a thing, please re-say it. Uh, how do you calculate the yield on a refinance done only to lower interest rate and decrease cash flow, no money out? I don't know that I would calculate the yield. You're resetting the loan to 30 years. So you're adding all of these things on the end. You're refinancing for the amount that you owe, not the amount that you purchased or initially got the mortgage for. Um, the cost of refinance is usually in the loan. So you're adding that to it. To me, it's, However many years I'm adding to the end of the mortgage is doing that worth the increased cash flow now. Um, and how much better is the interest rate? So for me, it was if the interest rate was two points or more, I would refinance almost no matter what. So when I had a 5.5, if I can get a three, I refinance two, loan, two mortgages to that. Um, so those ones are at three now. If somehow I could refinance to a 0.05% interest rate, I would refinance again. So I wouldn't care about the that. That's the way I looked at it. Was it a great enough decrease in the interest rate to justify the added years? Because I don't really care that mortgages get paid off. I care that the cash flow is enough. But I'm not going to add years to debt unless there's a good decrease in that rate, in that payment. So I don't know that I've ever looked at it as yield. I have looked at things like yield of I'm going to spend $5,000 to put in a wall. So that needs to get me to, I need to profit at least $500 more a year to get a 10% cash on cash return, right? I wouldn't do that for a $500 a year increase because it's a, it's a 10% cash on cash return where when you buy a rental property and, and my goal is to get that 10% cash on cash return, I'm also gaining appreciation on four times what I invested because I'm using a mortgage. I'm getting principal pay down. I'm getting the depreciation. I'm getting all these benefits, right? Plus the 10%. So if I'm going to spend 5,000, which I am on when this, I have a tenant moving out, I'm going to put in a wall and make a two bedroom into a three bedroom. It's literally all it needs is a wall with a door and a light switch. I'm, I'm budgeting about $5,000. It's going to be a little less than that. The rent increase is almost $500 a month for that third bedroom. That justifies that expense, even though I'm not getting increased depreciation, principal pay down, you know, like there's all those other things I'm not getting. So I, I, I want a bigger yield if it's an if it's an upgrade than I want if it's a purchase. Um, Matthew, I personally believe it's okay to purchase a break a break even property if your total portfolio supports the purchase with zero out of pocket. If my cash flow day one, but you're still benefiting from pay down, maybe. If you can't find a deal and you're breaking even, what are the interest rates on your other loans in your portfolio? I have a 4.8% interest rate duplex. I think before I bought a break even property, I might pay down the debt instead. Um, because break even, are you also counting CapEx, maintenance, property management in that break even as you just don't have cash flow? Um, I'm still going for the yield. Uh, and, and knowing what average is and then making sure that I get better in my area. Pay down is a benefit, but remember, you're going to pay taxes on pay down. So, Trini, howdy. How do you find a deal in a competitive market while people are overpaying located in Houston? People were overpaying two months ago. Wait to see what's happening in two months as interest rates go up. The buyer demand is vanishing. Ability to buy is vanishing. People's buying power is being diminished by higher interest rates. Um, so we had a buyer's, a seller's market for the last two years where you had to usually over asking price offers, waive contingencies, name your kid after the seller. You pay all closing costs. Like fear of missing out was on the buyer side. Well, we've had a baton handoff of fear of missing out to the seller side. Interest rates are gone, have gone up so much 
that people were projecting home, increase, home price increases to the point where they thought, I don't want to sell here, but when it finally hits here, I'm going to list my house for sale. Well, now they're not getting the offers. So what we're doing now in 2022, what I suggest is study your market, watch properties that go on. Two months ago, properties would have disappeared in an hour or two or gone pending. Now, at one week or two weeks, we're seeing properties that are still sitting on the market. Those ones you can make under asking price offers. And that you're not going to get all of them. You don't need all of them. You just need one. And one of them is going to be a motivated seller that needs to sell and is more interested in your ability to close than getting the highest price. So a little bit of patience and a lot of hard work, You know, at least 15 to 20 minutes a day, do the work every day to watch and be familiar with your market and be ready to start making those under asking offers or asking price offers with no competition, as long as the numbers make sense to you, as long as you're gonna get the yield that you're looking for. That's why we do the work every day, is because the market shifts and we have short memories. For the last two years, buyers paid closing costs. In 2018, sellers paid closing costs. Like that's how long, that's how short ago it was where sellers would, to try to make a deal happen, take care of the closing costs. Lori, the abandoned one is in good shape, awesome. Going to put your mom in it. There you go. A form of house hacking. Although if I was going to put my mom in a property, I would probably want to buy a property with a low down owner occupied loan and add to your portfolio and then put a tenant in the one that you already have. But that's just me. Matt. Howdy, Matt. Have you ever considered building new pros and cons? I'm way too lazy to do a build. I've never even done a rehab. Historically, there were times when buying properties cost too much so people would do a build. But in the last two years, the supply chain issues has made building less cost effective than buying an expensive property. Timeline, your burn rate, how long it's going to take. We're seeing up to 90 days to get windows in. I have a friend looking for cabinets and she's being told, you know, four weeks to eight weeks on something that she wants done in two weeks. Um it can make sense, and it can make sense to, to your portfolio. This last weekend, I met, and here's a great YouTube channel that you guys should check out, that ADU guy. And what he does is he builds ADUs. He's that ADU guy. So we're here on YouTube, that ADU guy. Check him out. He's got great content. Um, and part of his strategy is you buy a house by itself, and you think, oh, I would build an ADU, right? No, he's a genius. Buys a house by itself subdivides the lot and builds a house with an ADU. Like the, the multiple layers to building there, uh, there, there are very effective strategies. So if you're looking at building, that's where I would start. Look at his content. If you reach out, he actually puts his phone numbers in his videos and answers the phone when you call. Um, I wanted to do that when I first started too. And when you have five to 700 subscribers, great. <laughs> it gets hard to keep up with the emails when you start hitting and my channel's tiny. I'm just barely about to hit 10,000 subscribers. So I can't imagine that he will always be available on his phone, but jump on it now. Dividend Dave, are you a fan of card games like Magic the Gathering? I am not actually a fan of Magic the Gathering because I'm too lazy to build decks. I do have friends that play and I enjoy playing and I played, oh, there was a, there was a game, it was, wasn't World of Warcraft that came out on World of Warcraft that was card-based online. And it was pretty fun for a while. But again, building decks, the different strategies, like I love to play chess because, you know, there's like 20 different main strategies that I would use depending on what the opponent is doing. But with those decks, you've got a thousand strategies with a thousand counters. And uh, No, too lazy. <clears throat> d and Get a group together? Absolutely. But not the card games. Ryan, howdy. Can you list a few steps? Can you list a few steps or make a video in the future for steps to take after getting property under contract? I finally got the down payment together and actively making offers. I have a live stream called Buying a Rental Before during and after. And the first like 25 minutes are dedicated to literally what it sounds like before, during and after. So it's on my live stream list and, and my, my playlist, it's uh, you know the after hours live streams. So that's the place I would go for that. At some point I should with all my live streams, how I have that in, intro of here's the 
the topic covering. I need to pull that out and set it aside as a separate video. Um, not a tech guy though, so I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Um, let me know how it goes, Ryan. I'm, I'm curious to see how making the offers goes. Dividend Dave, how much reserves should you keep for each property? That is overthinking it. For me, it might not be for you. I'm just super, uh, it, the easier things are, the more likely I am to continue to invest. So when I had seven or less units, I kept $10,000 in reserve. That would cover a couple of months with no rent. It would cover a roof, it would cover a water heater, right? It would cover the basics. But as your portfolio scales, Murphy's fourth corollary kicks in because Murphy starts with, if something can go wrong, it probably will. The fourth corollary is if a sequence of events can go wrong, they will, and in the worst possible order. So as you have more units, that's why people say per unit, what do you do? 5,000, 10,000, whatever. Over seven, I raised it to 30,000. I figured that's a couple of months rent on more than one unit. That's a couple of roofs. That's a couple of water heaters. So I have 16 units, seven properties, 30,000 is my number while I'm working a W-2 job. So if I increase numbers, uh, unit count, I might increase that. If I stop working, I'm going to increase that. But if I sell my one single family house, use the money to pay off the two mortgages on two of the duplexes, increase my cash flow, but less than the amount I need to take care of, there wouldn't be no reason to increase or decrease that 30,000. It would be above seven, so I would still keep it there as long as I'm working. So that's how I do that. Very simple. Less than 30 seconds to explain. Don't need to know the value of the properties, the age of the properties, nothing. No no, no fancy overthinking. Just this is a nice round number that makes me able to, it's a swan. Like I could sleep well at night because of that. Aaron, howdy. Have you made a video on mindset? I've heard you mention it before, but I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on this subject. I think I've made several on mindset. My favorite one on mindset is called investing in real estate without spending any money. That's the mindset shift that, that got me to invest in real estate. And the previous mindset before I made that shift, mindset before I made that shift, stopped me from investing for 10 years. So investing in real estate without spending any money, that's the video I would go to for mindset. But I should probably make one that's literally called investor mindset. That is a great idea. Laura, 4.68 down to 3.25. So it's over a point. Um, and, how, and how many years are you adding to the mortgage? That would be my other one. So if I was if I was into the mortgage five years or less, I'd probably do that. If it was more than five years, I wouldn't want to reset for that. And then I would calculate what is the cash flow increase. Loco Eddie, howdy. Thanks for taking the time weekly to answer all the questions. When you started, how did you choose your buy box? Did you just fall into duplex, small multi? So my original goal was I owned a house, moved into an apartment to rent the house out for two years to get rental income on my tax returns and figured if I bought a house, lived in it for a year, I could buy a house, live in it for a year, buy a house and in 10 years, I'd have 10 properties. But single family don't cash flow here. Is that correct grammar? Single families don't. Okay, words are hard. Um, to, from law enforcement training, as a, as a police officer, you don't walk into the scene and say, I think this happened. Let me find evidence to back it up. So I don't go into the market and go, I want to invest in single family houses. Let me find evidence that will make that seem like a good investment. You go to the scene and you go, let me look at the evidence. Let me make a, a decision on based on what I think happened based on the evidence, but I have to be ready to shift my opinion on what happened based on how the evidence changes. So I looked at single family and they didn't cash flow. I looked at small multifamily and multifamily, but I didn't like the debt structure of multifamily, the amount of down payment it was required to do, all of the reasons why that didn't work. So then I looked at duplexes. I could have done triplex or fourplex, but it took me two years to save the little over $20,000 to have the down payment for just the duplex. So it would have taken more to save for something bigger. And I wanted to start the house hacking. So it was all based on what I found in my market. In your market, somebody is investing successfully. What strategy works? Go to the local REI meetups, network, ask questions, figure out what's working, what's not working. Like that ADU guy in his area, single family didn't seem to cash flow, small multi just doesn't exist or doesn't seem to cash flow. So he makes the deals. Alex, howdy. 
living with parents. I can continue that and buy a multifamily home that is over an hour away, does cash flow, or buy a single family to live in and then rent a year and won't cash flow. So most, a lot of house hacks don't cash flow while you live in it. We run the numbers as if it's the year after we've moved out. So if that single family won't cash flow after you move out and rent it out, then don't buy that. That's an alligator. Um, what about buying a single, you know, a small multifamily closer to you? So you don't commit mortgage fraud. Mortgage fraud is buying a place saying, I want to, I mean, I intend to occupy the place, but you're not actually going to move in. But if you were to buy a duplex, triplex, or fourplex with an owner occupied loan, and you continue to live with your parents because they, you know, mom does laundry and mom makes the food, whatever the deal is there, what, however that works. But there was a room in your small multifamily that was yours that you do go stay in, have stuff in, but you rent out the rooms in your unit and you rent out the other units that increases the cash flow. And then you're at that place as much as you want to justify. And you might find that you like living there more than it's your parents too. So you have a couple of other options. Um, and a lot of people say, well, there's no small multifamily in my area. You don't know that until you set up an auto search on the MLS. Redfin and Zillow very rarely list um, small multifamily or even have them on there. Um, they're just going to be on the MLS and they're going to be gone really quick. So that's how I would do that. Bobby, would you be willing to share the numbers you see in your area to buy a duplex and how much you'd put down and what the rents would be? seems like Washington is high. Curious how you make positive money. Sure. Um, one of the best ones to look at, well, no, because my interest rates changed. I bought a duplex in 2018 for 298000 and a friend bought one in November last year for 555000 and hers was a better deal. So that one really broke down the numbers on why hers could be a better deal, even though it costs so much more. Um. I can't do it during a live because I don't have the way to share my screen because of the way YouTube works. Um, I probably could if I have some upgraded Zoom thing that I stream through, but I'm not that tech, don't have it figured out yet. So I can make a video where I look at deals, compare, show you how I run the numbers, show you how I comp the rents. That, that's a great idea for a video. But making the positive cash flow, um, is a lot easier to do with the binder strategy. Confidently knowing that I'm gonna get rents up to at least within 10% of the area average rents at tenant's request without a rehab, without a tenant turnover consistently because it's happened 100% of the time now and not just for my deals, but for the deals I've helped people do it with um, makes it a lot easier to find them on the MLS. Some people run the numbers with the current rents at where they are. It can be really hard to find deals. That's why they're selling. They don't wanna raise the rents. They don't know that they can. Um, often. And you're right, numbers are high. So there's a concentric circle from the municipalities and the further you get out, the lower the prices get. So at some point there's a sweet spot where rents are catching up and prices haven't outpaced yet. Um, and then now it's finding that motivated seller that is aware that interest rates went up and that their wish list price of what they want to get for the property is probably not going to happen. Um, hope that helps, Bobby. And I do, I should make that video. Matthew. Yes, break even is considered all expenses. I was referring to the VA loans earlier. I like to evaluate your portfolio as a whole. Well, if you're using a VA loan, like I said, most house hacks don't cash flow while you're living there. Once you move out and that unit is rented, it should cash flow. Um, so if I can do a VA no money download and not lose money, that I'll be doing the same thing while I live there. I, when I moved into my first duplex, I was still paying $300 a month. To me, that was still a successful house hack. I moved into the fourplex and was and initially started making $1,700 a month. Now it makes $2,500 a month while I live there. Um, that doesn't suck. And then Indy took back a message because they like to make me lose sleep. I wonder forever what was said. Ryan, my market lags behind the national average. We are still in a seller's market, but I am still looking for great deals. I would watch for the next few months. I really think we're going to start to see a shift, but there are almost 400 markets in the U.S. and they're not all going to be the same. We're going to see more softening in, in larger cities, uh, depending on if the larger companies there require people to return to the office or not. Um, we're seeing still record wage inflation, still over 4 million people a month leaving their jobs with unemployment under 4%, which means they're not quitting their jobs. 
they're changing employers, which means the 5% uh, year on year wage increase that everybody's talking about from last year is a joke because it's really around 15 to 20%. Because when you change employers, you get a huge wage increase. That's why you're changing employers. Um, and so rents will be catching up still too. Indy, I am doing your spreadsheet daily, but I'm not 100% sure how to know what a good yield is for your market. It takes three months, maybe 60 to 90 days, two to three months to figure out what is an average yield is. And to make sure you're running your numbers right, what I like to do is find an investor in the area and ask them, hey, can you tell me the, the address of your property? I'd like to I'd like to run what I think the price that you paid was, because that'll be listed on Zillow or Redfin, what the area average rents are. And then I would like to tell you what I think my yield would be if I bought the place. Ask them how close you are. They'll give you feedback on, oh, it seems like you you forgot the HOA or you forgot that the property taxes here reset every year. And when you purchase it, you create a factual event that reset the price to the value. So like there's all kinds of things that you might not know you're not doing right or wrong right now. But when you ask somebody who has a property, knows their cash flow to compare it against what you came up with, don't ask them, can you tell me what your cash flow is? That doesn't help you. You need to calculate it, present it to them, and then get their feedback. Hopefully that helps. Army phaser, off topic, but what was your MOS? Combat engineer? No, I was the smartest dumb kid. I have a friend that might be getting into the game here, and that was his MOS, and he was able to use it around Kofji. I was in Kofji. I was in the Kofji event before Desert Storm. Um, oh, good memories. <laughs> Literally almost, no, that's an overshare. That's too much of an overshare. Um, <laughs> Um, drink time. Lost train pot. I am doing the live stream. What was your MOS? I was an 0352. So I, I joined the Marines as an 0311, which is infantry, like a, an 11 Bravo in the Army. Basically just told the, the recruiter, I want to blow stuff up. That's it. And in order to be a tow gunner in 0352, your score on the way the Marine Corps metrics is, first, you have to know which color of crayon tastes best, which is blue. Second, um, 120 or higher. So to be in the infantry, you had to have like an 89. So 89 to 120 or 89 and higher to be in the infantry. Um, to be a tow gunner, which was mechanized infantry, you had computers, it was a tube block, optically tracked, wire command link missile guided system that you had to be trained on. Your score had to be 120 or higher. So most of them were 128, 132, 131. I had a 120, the minimum score to become a tow gunner. So when I went through the MOS training, I struggled. I stayed most weekends to just try to get the theory down because um, literally, you don't join the Marines because you want to learn rocket science, right? Um, yeah, so that was my MOS. Not too useful on the outside world. Uh, Laura and Matthew taking their message back. Everybody's messing with me. Lumberjack. Matt, would you rather buy in high forest or in high moor? Maybe vacation in Rotham. Great show. Okay, so I don't know what Rotham is in high in the high forest or the high moor. I don't know what a moor is. That's like that's a race of people, right? The Moorish. Um, when I think of high moor, I think of like high swamplands. So I don't want to buy in the desert. I want to. I like the, the forest. I, I live in Washington State because I love the rain. There's like 217 words to describe green here. Um, I don't like extreme cold, so that took out the East Coast, basically. Uh, like We get snow here. It's maybe once a year for a week, and some years we go two or three years without snow. Um, so I would prefer to buy around forest, I think, because, one, I don't know what more is. Because uh, I went to school in Merca. Matt, you know that. I don't know those big fancy words. Um Maybe vacation in Rotham. I'm going to have to look up where that is. Sounds like a real place. Um, someday I'm going to have to take a vacation. This 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 working all the time. This is just killing me. You know, I'm like, today's Tuesday. I've been working two, two days. 
I can't take this. No, we're not meant as a species. We're not meant to work that many days in a row. Um, so it is time to figure out where to go next. Laura, 25 years, refinance up to 30 years, set extra money for 27 years. The money in the bank wasn't making me any money. Yeah, I probably would have done that too for that much of an increase. It's probably the minimum increase I would want to have done. You're still over a full percent, uh, but the extra cash flow invested with the yield of that cash flow invested over those years is going to do you a lot more work than not doing that refinance. Loco Eddie, so in your eyes, how much is enough in reserves and how do you decide on that number? I think I answered that uh, with the 10,000 when I was seven units or less and 30,000 at 16 going to increase it if unit count increases and going to increase it if I stop working which is more and more likely <laughs> me and Matt are in a race it's a race one of us is a tortoise one of us is a hare we don't know which one's which yet um I'm the short one <laughs> I got no hair that makes me the tortoise right um Jason Lumberjack, landlord. <laughs> Army Phaser, cheers. You were in 11 Bravo. Nice, cool. Uh, my nephew was in 11 Bravo as well. Um, stationed here at JBLM. He was in the Army. Uh, my niece was in the Army. I don't know her MOS. Uh, had injury or something and got out during MOS training. So she just did a bit. I was the first one in my family that anyone knows of who joined the military. My family pretty much disowned me. I was 17, didn't have a social security number. So when I went to do the, or the, the delayed entry program to en enlist before 18, I had to get a social. And that was when Uncle Sam found out about all my brothers and sisters. So all of us have the same social except for the last digit. So it's my fault that I ratted us all out to the government that we exist. Um, I was born in a dentist's office. Uh, Dividend Dave. No, oh, Indy. Always. Oh, Dividend Dave, I did a mock cash flow calculation for one of Millennial Mike's properties. I was close. Nice. That's a good strategy, too. Um, Jason C. Blue crayons. They are the best. Blue is the best crayon. Right. You have to know those kind of things. Army phaser. I was forced to be a tow gunner. Yeah. I was. I was literally the last one. Like, they, they needed one more body, and I was just at the cutoff. Um, yeah. Lumberjack, map, map behind me. Oh, the Highmores. Oh, where would I want to invest here? I don't know. There are over 400 books written by different authors in this setting. And every single one of them is about people being murdered. <laughs> so, not sure. Finally caught up with you, Matt. See? Where's a 64 pack for more variety? Exactly. <laughs> Jason, look behind you. <laughs> Matt, I understand everybody. Awesome. That was awesome. Cool. Evan, thank you. Um, we are reaching the three hour point, I think, or are we at the two hour point? I still have vodka left. Um, again, I want to thank tonight's sponsor, which is Alien Vodka. Um, <laughs> are you a gypsy? Oh. Ask that question when any of my family is around. Closest I would come is calling them travelers. Uh, my dad never wanted to own property. He told my brother never to own property because then they know where you are. Before my dad passed away, he found three apartments behind a bar. He lived in one and he rented out the other two. No one knows who the owners were. They like lived in Pennsylvania somewhere. He ran uh, power from the bar, paid the bar something. Um, yeah. So gypsy is a close terminology to it. No. North Cal. Thanks for all the info. A few questions. One, since market is changing, better to wait a little to buy a rental. Hunt every day and find one that meets your metric and make offers on the ones that made it. And that doesn't mean asking price or over or under. It means the number that makes sense to you. So you're hunting every day on that great deal. When you see it, just like any other day, always a good day to buy a great deal. Do you ever buy in a Roth IRA? I 
wouldn't because it's well so the, the Roth changes things but when you self-direct an IRA you take passive income and you turn it into earned income and you lose benefits like depreciation and those kind of types of write-offs can't self-manage put all kinds of controls in place for me I used retirement accounts as a reserve when I needed them I emptied it as soon as I had the opportunity to and put the money to work in a triplex I did benefit from 2020 when we had the pandemic I was able to not pay the 10% penalty because it was waived for that one year. And you can self-direct. I wouldn't. For me, I mistakenly for a while thought retirement accounts were a good thing and was maxing it out to get the tax benefit. Um, you know, hoping I would retire broke and hoping taxes would be less in the future. And have you met government? So... If you have money in a retirement account, fine. And if you have a match from your company, contribute for the match. I still do that. I hate it because it's money I'm locking up that's not mine. Um, but it's free money, right? So my brain says, logically, this makes sense. Take your emotions out. But don't go more than the match. Every penny that you can invest in real estate. So if you don't have any investing strategy whatsoever at all that gets you cash flow, appreciation, principal pay down, tax benefits, retirement accounts are a way to go. Have something when you get there. But... If you have an investing strategy where you're confident in your ability to get the return, any money that you lock up in a retirement account is lost money. The opportunity cost to get cash flow, appreciation, principal, pay down, tax benefits is massive. So don't over contribute beyond the match. That's my, my path that I chose. Two, do you ever, no, that was the other thing. Three, non real estate. Is there a pending diesel shortage? It sure seems like it, um, and I'm not enough involved in it to know if it was created on purpose or not, but there's a lot of things that keep happening like that. There could be a pending diesel shortage, um, which will, of course, affect price, which affects transportation of all goods, which is going to impact inflation again. Um, I still think we're going to see a recession this year. Lumberjack landlord got me. thought you would teach you where that was. Yeah, I know me and Matt, we should do some lives together. Matt has the technology. He's got, we, we did it one time where we did a live stream together. I was actually going to ask you, Matt, how to do that because I want to do a live stream with us. I want to do one with Millennial Mike. Um, yeah. And Julie with the, are you a gypsy? Yeah, that that's a group. My family freaks out over that word for some reason. I don't care. I joined the Marines and found out there's a whole world out here. Uh, when my dad passed away, this guy contacted me. I'm the new elder, and this is who your daughters are going to marry. And it literally took death threats to make sure that most of my family never contacts me again. Uh, yeah. Sometimes our family is what we survive. You don't get to pick your family. So never be embarrassed by your family. Don't feel obligated to your family because you didn't get to pick them. Um, yeah. Stephen, howdy. Looking at a sixplex in Nevada, rents very... 725 to 775 market is 1340. How would you raise the rents closer to market? Need the income to pay the mortgage. So one of the reasons why I'm so active on bigger pockets and in the Facebook groups and trying to share this information is because I have a strategy that gets tenants to request a rent increase. Like they literally ask me to raise the rent, thank me when I acquiesce, and have very little tenant turnover. Um, it is called the binder and we're we're a little over three hours now um so i'm going to suggest you look up the video the binder let me see if i can actually just get a link for you and i will put the one you should watch um of course now if i click on it it's going to It doesn't let me share without clicking on it, which will start playing it. Um, there it is. Okay, so might have to hit mute here in a second. Yep. Okay. And I could share this. Here's the video. that you will use. Uh, 
Um, Julie, don't apologize. I have, I have that word. I laugh at that. I think that word's hilarious because my family freaks out. I use the word all the time. Um, that's how we love each other. So I put in the video, there's a short one, like a five minute one, but that's the 20 minute version that I did as a course for Michael Zuber's course, one rental at a time. It, like it, it literally breaks down the nuance of exactly how and when and what I do before, how I get the conversation to get the tenants to request the rent increase. So imagine now, if you if you want 1340 for market, you kick out the tenant, you spend five to $15,000 rehabbing the unit, new flooring, maybe cabinets, whatever you need to do to get it rent ready. And then you rent it out for 1340. So now you're $10,000 in the hole. Or you go have this conversation with the tenants. You use that method from that video the tenants ask probably for the rent to go up to eleven to twelve hundred, so somewhere in there, without you having to do a rehab, without you having to displace a tenant, without you having to screen tenant, without you having to do all of the the you know, carry the burn rate while you're you're spending money before you get a tenant in there by having a ten minute conversation. Like it takes longer to watch the video than it does to have the conversation. So I'm glad you found the channel, Stephen. That strategy is why I do this content. And Julie, you don't mean to be rude. Yeah, like I said, don't, don't be, uh, don't, don't apologize. I have a weird family. Um, Army phaser. Without any notice, they took your M4 and team away. You got a tow and M2 to replace them. Julie, why so paranoid? Because you nailed it. They hate the word, but that's what I would call my family. Um, other than mentally challenged, I would add gypsy to the end of it. Did you get your $1.3 million accepted? Keith, how? I did not. The $1.3 million offer on the first property is not for sale yet. I have resubmitted an offer at 1.3 because I offered 1.1 originally. I offered 1.3 using Michael Zuber's strategy that he talks about with Stephen Dow, which I'm pretty sure is the guy who talks about it with him, on 50% loan from a lender, 40% seller financed, 10% down payment, at asking price of 1.3, haven't heard back yet. So they didn't reduce to 1.1, which is the number that made sense to me. But with the blended rate under 4%, the 1.3 actually makes sense to me. But they have to do seller carry for the 40%. Hendrick, howdy. Looking for a primary with my significant other. She is concerned we will be paying more in interest expense than the house is actually worth. What is your take? So you're looking for a primary. Okay, so if you're looking for your primary, I told her the home prices will be much higher by the time we paid off the mortgage. That is true. But, so buying a primary, remember, is a liability. If you're buying your house before you buy rental properties, you're slowing down your ability to invest. But if that's the decision you make, you know you're buying a liability. It's going to cost you money. It'll be worth more money there later. If interest rates are high now and you wait and you look for properties that sit on the market, you might be able to offer less than asking. You might you don't have to go over like we did two months ago. So if you can get a little under asking, which is a number that only made sense to the seller, get your number as good as you can. What happens in the future if the rates go back down? You can refinance. So... If you wait, rates could be 7, 10, 15% in the next three to four years. They could go down. Prices continue to go up. The longer you wait, the more you're going to pay. Even if, let's say, interest rates went up and prices came down a lot, you're still paying more because the interest rates went up. And there's no guarantee that they'll come back down so you can refinance. Anything that you wait for, you have the expense of what you're paying in rent. You have every month you're not gaining appreciation on your property. You're not getting principal pay down on your property because part of the mortgage you're paying is actually paying down the loan. Like you're missing out on that every month. If your intent is to buy a house anyways at some point, the longer you wait, the more you're going to pay. Um, and you asked your last four words. What is your take? My take is house hack. Buy a house with an ADU. Rent out one so you reduce or eliminate your housing expense. Buy a duplex. There are duplexes that are four bedrooms each side with two car garages. Like there's all types of, of versions of house hacking out there where you do that for like five years 
you within 10 years, you never have to work again in your life for the average person. Like it does suck for five years, but if you can figure that out, the rest of your life is exponentially better. That's my take. And you did ask, what's my take? Um, Lumberjack, let's do this. You have Zoom Pro almost any time. Nice. <laughs> Julie, you were not rude, not at all. Um, I think it's f funny. Um, your name, your friend was called a gypsy the other night. I saw the hate and rise. Yeah, so that's the reaction my family has. Um, but my family is also a bunch of racist rednecks. Grew up in Southern California. Imagine how many slang terms I know for people who are Hispanic. Um, yeah. But sometimes our family is what we escape. Like, like we survive the family. Indy, thank you. Thank you. Julie, I signed on selling your duplex today. You'll get 265,000. It will go into renovations at your 11 unit and some new socks, new socks. Like Matt, you finally get some new socks. It's funny how the little things actually do stand out. Um, Hendrick, thank you. She's against multifamily. So we are looking for houses with basements, ADUs to be able to Airbnb or rent. Cool, great. Um, yeah, that's a great plan. And it's not forever. It's for now, a couple of times. And I'm going to give it a couple more minutes to see if there's any more questions that come in before we wrap up for the night. I really want to thank everybody who took the time to hang out. And uh, <laughs> gypsy oversharing at the end happened because of the, the alien. I'm going to blame it on the alien. Uh, you are going to be alive in five years. Start investing like it. The purpose of this video was to give you those six actionable steps to get started in real estate. Those steps work whether you have no rentals, 10 rentals, you've been doing this two weeks or 10 years. Those same steps work. The six steps in order was to save by increasing your income, decreasing your expenses and invest the difference. Work on your credit score, get it to 740 or higher. Too much vodka. Pick a strategy. Figure out the way you're going to invest. Or no, talk to a lender. The third one is talk to a lender to figure out what your options are. Fourth is pick your strategy. The strategy has to meet three things. What is What will work with your goal? What will get you towards your goal? What will work with your resources? What can you actually do? Do you need partners? What do you need to change in your life to have more resources? And third, what will work for your skill set? Fifth, we need to talk to an agent, get those auto searches set up for the strategy that you're going to use, and sixth, run the numbers. Look at deals, filter through deals, deal after deal after deal until you learn your area average and you figure out if your strategy will work there or if you need to tweak it. So, Bobby, thank you. Miss Noi No No. Noi No No? Howdy. Probably butchered that. How would you house hack if you're caring for an elderly person with special needs? How many elderly people do you think there are with special needs who live in an apartment? I would put them on ground floor one, right? First floor. So I would all of the duplexes that I look for, I want side-by-side -side units anyways. I would probably stay away from the townhome style like my fourplex where you have stairs. But I would look at buying a small multifamily, duplex, triplex, fourplex. My triplex that everybody... So here's an example for Hendrix. Your wife is very much against multifamily. My triplex is a house and a duplex with three totally separate yards with three totally separate driveways. It's a multifamily. You house hack the house, you rent out the duplex. So if you have an elderly person, I would look for ground floor so you're not dealing with stairs. Make sure that it's access accessible to them. Um, but I would look at duplex, house with ADU, exactly like I did it with small kids. Uh, well, she was eight, so she was not small-ish. She was small-ish. Um, so it's completely possible to do it. Whenever we have something like, I have kids, so I can't house hack. I'm taking care of an elderly person who has special needs, so I can't house hack. I have X, Y, Z reason. Flip that script. I had kids. I had to house hack. Or I'd be working forever and my kids would inherit nothing. Now I don't have to work. At 48, I was able to stop working, never have to work again in my life. My kids are going to inherit millions. You're taking care of somebody who's elderly, who has special needs. 
what better reason can you think of than fixing your financial future? Like that's the reason to house hack. Uh, so great question. I'm super glad you came to hang out and watch the content. Uh, I hope you get your auto searches set up and let me know how it goes. That'd be cool. Louis, thank you. Oh, I got it right. Thank you. Hendrik, that's a great example. Unfortunately, with our market, it would be out of our price range, but great to keep an eye on for the future. Remember, as you're going up in price range, 3.5% down for FHA is not a lot of money. A million dollars, you're talking, was that $35,000 uh, for the down payment? And the rental income from the other units can offset your debt to income ratio. So you might have more options than you're thinking until you actually go and sit and talk with a lender. Cool. Ryan, thanks again. Thank you, Ryan. Larry, I saw April Crosley vid. They use an income verification service called the closing documents. Tenant signs on, so TCD runs bank accounts. That reports all deposits in the past 12 months of verifying income. Good. Like it. April Crossley's video on the closing documents. So that's the name of the company. Cool. Dom, howdy. I want to say thank you for your bigger pockets and the many other real estate investors that are sharing their experience and their knowledge. Your wealth of advice has helped me get into five doors in two years. That is awesome. Congratulations. That's cool. All right. We're going to call it there for the night. Thank you all for hanging out. I really appreciate it. Remember, if my content somehow earned a thumbs up, let me have it. And the, the last thing to wrap up with, there's this app that you get when you're a YouTube content creator. See this YouTube studio? It looks like this, shows you your videos. There's this section that says comments. So every now and then I'll go to this section that says comments and you're here, it says right here. This actually says, I know it looks really short, but it says, we're sorry you're a very sad person that has no friends and nobody wants to talk to you. It's really hard to think. I can't believe they got in such a small space. But I'll take this and I'll swipe down. And there's no comments on 200 videos. That's why I drink the vodka. So anytime you watch a video or you rewatch a video and you leave a comment, it makes my day. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk.